Well, howdy there, everyone. Welcome to episode 113. We have a guest from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, waiting in the background here, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, ben and I are on the show today. Luke is parading himself up the East Coast, um, taking some amazing aurora and uh, creek on beach shots, actually, which I just jealously saw <coughs> yesterday and today. So um, he's fine, uh, but he's on the road today. So um, And when we have guests from the US in particular, we've got to uh, pick specific times and work it out with everyone. And that's the beauty of having uh, three hosts. So we don't we always sort of have everyone on the job. I've been uh, busy editing all my work from Svalbard, actually, Ben, uh, this week, yep. and, and just looking at uh, some articles with the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age and another one called The Rob Report, so that are all sort of kicking around. but working with an amazing travel writer. Um, yeah, amazing. Awesome. And uh, I was up till three in the morning editing a, a drone video of um, the kayaking footage I had from there, which I hadn't put together yet, which was pretty fun. Yeah, incredible. That sounds awesome. And, oh, yeah, very much looking forward to seeing your work from that big trip. It'll be yeah, fantastic time. Yeah, we'll get we'll get it on a show sometime, folks. Um, we've got more important people like today at the moment, but uh, also just preparing to leave in a couple of days for the opening of the Men with Heart exhibition in Adelaide. So, for those of you that don't know, that's a twenty-three year long photo documentary project on exploring and sort of defining what uh what healthy masculinity is in australian culture it's a very powerful intimate and multimedia project of, of both photography and, and words and, and video interviews of of men uh and kind of deep really intimate um open-hearted space and it's won a lot of awards for its impact on the on the impact of and well-being of, of men and boys in australia and uh it's really nice to get it traveling around the country and, and as it travels around the country we we get the local men's community to wrap around it and to support it. And in this case, we've got like eight different events that are happening during the exhibition itself. And one already happened yesterday, actually, um, where we use the exhibition as a focal point for people to come together and explore and, and celebrate and, and even experientially kind of experience some elements of what, what good men's work is. So, so that's part of the, uh, South Australia Living Arts Festival that's uh, just kicking off uh, for a couple of months in South Australia. So uh, if anybody's in South Australia and they want to come, um, I'll put a link in the show. Uh, essentially, it's in Adelaide uh, or contact me directly. The opening's on Friday night, which is invitation only, but if you want to come, reach out to me directly. I might better get you in, but there's also a artist talk on Saturday the 12th of August from 1 to 2 p.m. That's all welcome. Um, but I should be telling you the actual address of the place because that would be useful. <laughs> so it's at the Minor Works Building Community Centre, 22 Stamford Court, Adelaide. So it's fairly central Adelaide. And uh, I'll be there probably most of the day, Friday and Saturday as well, personally. Uh, it's open from 9 to 5 on the Saturday and 12.30 to 4.30 on this. Sorry, 9 to 5 on Friday and 12.30 to 4.30 on the saturday and it'll be up for six weeks till the 27th of uh september really powerful show it's a whole sort of non-profit sort of thing so it's very much about bringing community awareness and it's beautifully supported by the adelaide um adelaide city council as well who've offered the space to us and um yeah so sometimes it's really good to get anything from school groups to organizations or anyone that's sort of you know, wants to have a bit of a more intimate look and exploration of 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 what uh, what defines healthy masculinity. It's a, it's a powerful body of work. Ben, what have you been up to, brother? Um, yeah, busy as usual. Um, just this weekend, went snowshoeing up to South Rams Head and Kosciuszko, which was a good time. Um, yeah, it's been a few years since I last snow camped. Um, uh, so yeah, no, I had a great time doing that. Um, and yeah, so it's a bit of a slog getting up there, a few hours in snowshoes. And I've been not, not in the greatest uh, uh, fitness bump over the last few months. So that really uh, shocked me into gear, um, especially before I go to New Zealand in, in October. So need to get training again uh, to make sure I'm fit for that. But no, it was good. Um, got some lovely light on Saturday night. Um, and it was pretty, pretty damn cold too. So, um, but no, beautiful conditions. It was super still. Um, pretty clear yesterday morning but some, yeah nice cloud and light coming through and um yeah got to test how capable my winter gear was again before i head to the dolomites in february um yeah lots of dolomites planning at the moment as well that's a quite a logistically heavy trip 
um, for a winter visit. Like in summer, it's all very like lots of infrastructure. Uh, for anyone who is familiar with the Dolomites, it's you know, a very popular location naturally. Um, but yeah, there's roads and uh, refugios and stuff up in the mountains right below the most iconic mountains in the entire area. So summer, it's a, quite easy, but yeah, just the the nature of having to navigate Alps like that in winter becomes much more challenging. So um, yeah, I've been looking into that recently and doing a lot of research and zooming around Google Earth and figuring out what accommodation will be open and all that kind of stuff and um, how far I'll have to be <laughs> snowshoeing in um, without too much avalanche risk and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's been a new kind of um, field for me as uh, someone who, you know, being in mainland New Australia, um, there's not a ton of uh, like kind of, yeah, high altitude snow opportunities. Um, so that's part of what this past weekend was about as well, just to see how I'm equipped for that. Uh, but yeah, very excited. I've, uh, first kind of six months of this year has been a little quiet for me, landscape photography wise. Um, my other photography has been really, really busy, but um, yeah, from sort of October onwards, I've got a fair bit going on. So very, very keen to see where the portfolio will be in a year's time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at at this point. Yeah. Mountaineering's not for the faint hearted man. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, it's given me huge else. respect, huge respect for those who um, just on another level, totally another level to anything I'll be able to do um, for people that do it up in, in Tassie and doing Federation Peak, all that kind of stuff. Um, I was talking to Bruno Pisani, who's a knows the Dolomites like at the back of his hand. He's a legend over in Italy. Um, he's got a great YouTube channel for anyone who's interested. Um, and he's, yeah, summiting 4,000 meter peaks like in a day and heading back down the same day, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, camping on top of Marmalada and Mont Blanc over in France, 4,000 meter peaks, um, insane stuff. And he's doing it all with a big smile on his face and creating good content at the same time. So yeah, if anyone wants some Italian um, sort of inspiration, go check out Bruno Pisani on YouTube. He's been really helpful for me, um, figuring out some of those logistics as well. So yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, I think, speaking of diversifying the folio and what else is coming up, I'm um, and seeing as all, all three of our uh, uh, guests on the show and presenters are, are part time wedding photographers as well. I'm just setting up one um, in Fiji, actually, mm. uh, which I'm pretty excited about. And I've never been, and uh, you know, uh, the the bride's marrying an indigenous um, gentleman, so so the village life and and that, that sort of culture will be a really big part of the experience. And uh, I'll probably head over for a week and just dive dive right in and funny enough it's uh it's uh, a bride that actually met on the trip to Svalbard which I just got back back from so that's sort of funny how yeah, things amazing. work and uh as I've said you know I I don't advertise my wedding photography it just usually happens by referral but I've been shooting for 20 25 years so um yeah so speaking that's of good. diversity and speaking of mountaineering um there's probably not many photographers I know in the world that are as diversely capable as our guests tonight uh, Taylor Glenn holds from uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, but he's originally a North Carolina boy. Uh, but he's been there for quite a long time. And that's, uh, I met Taylor 15 years ago in 2007 in downtown San Francisco at the Apple Store, I believe. <laughs> and I remember just reaching out to him uh, at one stage and we hit it off with a really wonderful friendship. And we have had a great friendship ever since. We don't get to catch up too often, but when we do, we do it right. And uh, the last time we did it properly was with an incredible journey down the Grand Canyon and skiing in Jackson Hole and perusing through the back of the Four Corners and Capitol Reef National Park and um, different sort of state areas, sort of doing some slot canyoning and uh, what did we do? Rappelling down at this Pine Canyon and the Zion National Park. We had, we had a hell of a catch up. So, so yeah. And I buggered off and went surfing in Hawaii after that, which was, which was, uh, which was fine by me. So, um, so what we've set up tonight is, uh, is a basically a really good catch up with Taylor and I, and we're going to share this journey down the Grand Canyon, uh, which we did in midwinter in I think 2014, I think it was. And we did it in the sort of November, November, December, or sort of November, I think. And that was that meant we're moving into winter season, and uh, you know it was a little bit sort of wild. It was it was snowing like hell before we even started the trip. But um, 
So Taylor is, he lives in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And if you didn't know, that is one of the more beautiful places in America. And it's nestled right under the Grand Tetons and it's the gateway to the Yellowstone National Park. Taylor is a fastidiously amazing outdoorsman. He is a very talented climber and hiker and he's a what with a rafter. He's a mountain biker. He's a surfer and I don't even know what else, but, um, but Speaking of the diversity of who he is, he's also a very, very talented high-end wedding photographer and a beautiful position to do that well in Jackson Hole. He's an extremely diverse commercial photographer and he works for people like Nat Geo and Nikon and Smithsonian, like all sorts of um, different sort of editorial sort of projects, documentary projects, all different places around the world, not just in America. Uh, very, very well-traveled man. Um, he's one of the few photographers that's successfully still running uh, a full-time photography business. And as all three of us here tonight are aware of, that is no mean feat and requires a certain sort of mindset and, and diversity of approach to, to make that sustainable, which we'll probably reflect on. So, um, so just be aware that it is a catch up between friends as much as a shared journey tonight. So it's going to be that kind of show. And uh, we're going to share a little bit of it together. You know, I've presented on, on this journey before and probably even more than Taylor, actually. So so we're going to be very conversational and fluid about what comes up and how we run it and the time frame we have. But it's it's going to be fun and there's going to be some pretty rad stories. So um, welcome, Mr. Taylor Glenn. All right. Thank you, Paul. Great to see you guys. Good to meet you, Ben. Uh, appreciate you guys having me. It's uh, It's been a long time coming. I know we've been talking about this for a minute. and. Uh, it's great to finally connect and make it happen and uh, excited to share some pictures and tell some stories. Yeah. So we we're, we're sort of on that diversity, you know, like Taylor um, being who he is, you know, it's as much as we generally have a landscape show, this is very much going to be a show about an adventure and a storytelling approach. You know, if you've got someone like Taylor, who's an editorial, you know, documentary commercial travel lifestyle photography, landscape is, is just a part of his repertoire. So so that'll reflect sort of in the imagery that we um that we share tonight. It's going to be as much about telling the story as anything else. But um, but geez, what a landscape to to have as our as our backdrop. What, how would you describe your sort of relationship with the Grand Canyon, Taylor? Oh man, well as as you said, we've been down this together, which was 2014. Um, I was quite fortunate to do two trips since that one. So I've I've just recently done my third trip to this extraordinary place. And, you know, I like, it, it's so big, it's so massive, it's hard to even really, you know, talk about or wrap your head around completely because there's just so many, it, it's just such a vast, special, wonderful wilderness. And, you know, most people who get to visit it uh, do so from, you know, car at the South Rim, they go and drive and they look out, of, you know, across the canyon and see those, amazing views and um you know then there's a, a much smaller subset of the population that has the great privilege to float the colorado river via raft or another type of craft and you know spend up to 30 days uh that you know some permits will allow and you know to be able to see that wilderness from that perspective is an extraordinary privilege and um and, and just a, a unique experience in the world, um, you know, to be able to take that amount of time and really become, you know, immersed in this place. You know, there's probably not a, a lot of, you know, trips available in the world apart from, you know, very extreme high-end expeditions where you get that sort of time, you know, to be in a place, you know, completely immersed cut off from, you know, the outside world and really just being present and uh, getting to getting to take it all in. And so, uh, you know, I, I feel so lucky to be able to have done this and, and of course, to be able to photograph it and share it and tell stories about it is, is just a really cool opportunity. So excited to, you know, kind of see where all this goes and, and, uh, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, relive, re relive some good memories and, and share some new ones. Yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to sharing so many new ones. Like, like I, like the way we set up this trip, I was, um, well, I was originally going to be a guide, wasn't I, Taylor? And, and uh, I started, and I've been guiding in Tasmania a fair bit, um, 
over the years on these tiny sort of small rafts uh, relative to what you take the other Grand Canyon and very, very different water levels. Um, and basically I'm just the steering at the, at the back end of the boat and, and actually the, the people on the boat of the engine, relatively speaking. And when I looked at the boats for the Grand Canyon, they were uh, twice as long, three times as heavy. And the only person operating them was yourself <laughs> and yeah. with 10 foot oars. And I was one ton of boats and I was like, Oh my Lord. And, and Taylor reached out to, um, uh, to me uh, quite early on. I think it's, it's very much, uh, it's one of the most sought after private trips in the world. And up to fairly recently, the waiting list was, was, you know, sometimes over a decade or even more in length to even get a chance to go down privately. There are commercial trips to book out through the summer, which you can do for a fair chunk of chunk of money, but privately it's, it's one of the most sought after trips on the planet and difficult to get to. And it's only fairly recently ish. They, they switched it to a semi lottery system as well as a waiting list. So, so we kind of got a bit lucky, didn't we Taylor? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could say that, uh, you know, it's, there is, there was for a long time, a waiting list. They restructured it to try to move some of those people through the system and get them on the river. I believe that, you know, all private trips, commercial trips combined each year, there's something like maybe 30,000 people that are actually on the river uh, in, in a calendar year. So if you compare that to probably millions of visitors that, you know, drive to the, you know, South Rim to visit the park, you know, it's, it almost doesn't even really compare in terms of like numbers. And uh, so, yeah, it's a very limited opportunity you know, it's an extraordinary resource and, you know, that program is really important. You know, obviously all wildernesses that we know and love around the world are being loved to death. And, you know, having this management, having, you know, the, the structure and regulations in place to, uh, you know, really protect those parks and those these special places are more important than ever. And so, um, you know, that, that lottery system really, you know, and the, and the way that they manage this this river and, and through the park is is really incredible. And it really, um, you know, is doing a great job of preserving this place. And, you know, there's always going to be demand to do it. Um, it. It seems like it's harder every year just because of the numbers of people that want to do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you have an opportunity, I, you know, I always tell people if you ever get invited or you have some sort of opportunity to do this. It's like one of those things that you drop everything and you, you figure out how to make it happen. You know, it's obviously a big ask for a lot of people. It's a lot of time. It's not easy to, you know, pull out of, you know, your day-to-day -day life and, and do a trip like this. So, um, you know, we're, we certainly are lucky in so many different ways to, to have been able to see this place. And, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's just, I, I'd, I'd go back in a second as soon as I could, you know, and, I feel lucky that I've been able to do it multiple times. Well, I remember Taylor when you when you first reached out to me, like it was like, dude, <clears throat> there's twelve spots. There's about a hundred people that want to go. <laughs> do you want one? Don't muck around. And uh, I think I maybe took about ten seconds to say yes because I knew enough to know that it was potentially, particularly the way the waiting list was running at the time, maybe even a once a lifetime opportunity to do so. So I, I knew of people that were literally, you know, 10, 15 years on the waiting list and still hadn't got down there. So, uh, so I knew it was a, yeah. And it's a big chunk of time. Like, uh, you know, we did 23 days. So we were just shifting into the kind of uh, semi start of winter sort of season and the commercial season is just winding up and it's pretty much just private trips from then on, I believe. And when it goes into the deep, deep, deep winter, they allow up to 30 days uh, on the permit. And it's very strictly permitted. I think in summer, it's about 40 days. And you literally have to get through and get off the river in that time. And it's very strict. So it changes your river experience. And also you've got the different sort of time of the day to deal with. So in a winter trip, you've got much less daylight. So you've got less time on the river. So you actually physically need longer to be able to make the trip as well. But um, in our case, we had a bit of an unusual experience. So that even though there's... 30,000 people to go down this river, like they flooded the damn thing while we we're on it, wiped out all the campsites. And half the time it felt like there was no one else on earth that had ever even been there. And it was like this, this whole Canyon had gotten washed through 
And we had this very unusual, quite special experience of, of it feeling like we were the only ones there and had been for a long time, which was a bit unexpected. And it wasn't actually the original plan, was it, Taylor? <laughs> yeah, that, so what Paul is referring to is it's called the high flow experiment. And just a little bit of background behind that, the, you know, the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River for, you know, especially for those of you who are, uh, you know, there in Tazi and Ozzy and, uh, you know, the, that this part of the world, uh, you know, this, the Colorado is one of the most controlled rivers in the world. Uh, you know, the United States has got dams all over the place and the Colorado River, you know, is, is a major resource for the entire southwestern United States. You know, 40 million people depend on the water. There's major agriculture that exists solely because of that resource. And so the Glen Canyon Dam uh, is is the the dam above the uh, Colorado River and the section above the Grand Canyon. Uh, behind the dam is Lake Powell. And so that reservoir, you know, is there for water storage and they, they regulate the flows through the canyon uh, via Glen Canyon Dam. And so, um, you know, again, like the, the flows are there um, based on, you know, the whims of the Bureau of Reclamation and, you know, the needs of water uh, and, and so on. It's very complex. I couldn't even begin to explain it all, but um, every now and then, because the river is so controlled, you know, we don't get the spring flooding. And that um, high flow experiment is meant to, uh, uh, to uh, simulate the spring flooding that would typically occur when you have runoff after a, a winter snowpack. And so uh, it just so happened that during our trip, they decided, you know, two weeks ahead of our uh, launch date to let everyone know that they were going to, you know, run this experiment. And uh, that meant that they would be cranking up the levels uh, of the flow from a normal of around 10,000 cubic feet per second to uh, somewhere in the, um, uh, realm of 40,000 cubic feet per second. I, I don't know what that goes in uh, meters, but it's a lot. And it, lot. it really just completely changed the river uh, to this like violent torrent that, you know, it's hard to even <laughs> begin to explain. But, um, you know, of course, early on, we were all pretty, you know, intimidated and a bit, a bit freaked out by it because we didn't quite know what to expect. But, um, you know, it turned out to be this magical experience. And as Paul was saying, we, we kind of, you know, got to see the, the canyon um, sort of replenished. Uh, the beaches were buffed out. They, it, it changes sediments. It really, um, you know, just sort of, you know, emulates what, ha what happened in, in the normal cycle of, of floods that you would have yearly. And, and so, you know, to be able to witness that um, was, was quite unique and, you know, we were actually very lucky. And so, um, you know, at the time it was pretty scary, but it, it turned out to be a, a really cool and, and unique opportunity. Yeah, it was scary. Taylor, I just pulled up a, a very, very basic map of, of the, the structure of the river. So you can see that Lake Powell that uh, Taylor was talking about up on the sort of northeast side of things. And Lee's ferries, where you generally start the journey. Uh, and you, you're often spend the night before in Page. Uh, sort of setting yourself up. And I remember the night before Taylor was, it started bucketing down with snow. And when we woke up in the morning, we all went running for the stores to buy extra jumpers and <laughs> different things just going, oh my God, what kind of trip are we in for here? It's going to be freezing. And there's no getting off this river. So basically you're going down for 23 days in our case um, with vertical sided cliffs. And there's only one point you can even get off or out of the river which is at Phantom Ranch kind of in the middle. And even that's like a 5,000 foot descent. So you, you're pretty isolated for the entire time. So what you've got with you is what you've got with you. And um, we didn't have an official guide. We, we had Taylor as our leader and we had Nips. You have to have somebody who's actually done the trip before. Uh, it's actually, you can speak about the process more, Taylor, in terms of what it takes to actually get a private trip over the line. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many different ways to go about this. And, you know, I, I, you know, I can speak to my experience, obviously, and this has been the case with both my other trips as well. Uh, there's several businesses based in Flagstaff, Arizona, that's sort of the hub of the community uh, for the outfitters and just really the, you know, that, that region to begin with. And so, uh, 
we we hired an outfitter to uh, basically provide all the gear, the food, all of the you know equipment that you would need to do this trip. And it, it's actually quite amazing. You it can essentially show up with your, you know, your your clothes and your sleeping bag in a tent, and they take care of everything else. And so, um, you know, it's it makes it somewhat. I mean, it, the, you know, the logistics of putting something like this together would just. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, trying uh, to feed long. that many people for that many days, and um, it's quite it's quite a project. And so, you know, these. And, outfitters are incredible they really take care of all that so that you can focus on you know the trip and having fun and, and just you know the things that you want to focus on and, and so that that really makes it doable for most people because i mean very few people own all this type of equipment so um that really is you know a, a huge component to making this this trip work and you know yeah we we uh you know we got all the things we needed and they take you down there and they help you rig and they push you off and you know, you're off for whatever time you got on your permit and, you know, you take everything, you know, whatever you took with you is what you got. And when you get to the end, hopefully you still got everything and all your people and they're there waiting for you when you, uh, when you get done to pick you up and, and take you back. So it's, uh, it's quite a circuit. And it's, yeah, it's heavily logistical, logistic, logistical trip. Like it's a lot of time spending taking gear on and off the boats, um, it took me, oh, it took me, I don't know, seven or 10 days to figure out where everything was. So there's a complex system between four boats where everything's organized and, you know, the butter might be on under this section on boat four and the, and the matches are on boat one under another section and the kitchenware is on boat three somewhere else. And, and it's sort of like every night you're just like going, oh my God. So you actually had to spend a lot of time sort of understanding and wrapping your head around how they've designed it. And every centimeter of these boats is is designed and packed in a way that just gets everything you need down down the river for that length of time and and the menu system was incredible they they literally had things packed so they had even sort of meat meals you know two weeks down the track was still somehow being kept cool by the way they packed it and you know we started off on the on the sort of edge of the river um it just and it, it sounds sort of easier than it is like it, there's a lot that goes on to set it up set up a trip like this and and i actually almost got in trouble enough that i didn't get to bloody go because uh peg the ranger uh came up to me and said passport please and i was like what you know, how do i need a passport to go, <laughs> go down to the Grand Canyon? what are you talking about you ain't going down the river without your passport so i'm like and i was like what and of course, we'd packed away all our stuff and left it in uh, Flagstaff, and we had no reason to have one. And I was like, "Oh my god, I've come all the way around the world, and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get stopped going down this trip because I haven't got a piece of paper." And uh, and Peg was, and we were like talking about whether I just skived it off of the bush and tried to meet the guys like two kilometers down the way, or how the hell I was gonna get in and. And luckily it turned out I fluked it. I just left one tiny little bag like under a seat. I must've accidentally left it in the car and I had my passport in it. But um, you get a real drilling from, from the lady here. We are sort of setting up the boats and they're just blank canvases sort of there. And we start sort of building up the structure uh, slowly. And uh, we've got to have room for the beer, of course. <laughs> and, uh, funny enough, uh, that actually was quite a functional way to ballast the boats and move the weight front to back as, as, as the food sort of shifted and how we packed the boat worked differently. It, it had a sort of logistical role as, as well as a functional one. And here's uh here's the truck that turns up with all the equipment and all the gear. And um, you had to be pretty specific about what you could or couldn't bring. And we had limitations individually about, you know, how many bags and what we we're allowed to carry. And, um, you know, as photographers, that's there's almost like an extra bit of pressure there. That's our outfitter there, sort of talking us through the design of the boats and how things are set up slowly. And you kind of really got to listen because if, if the shit is the fan and you flip a boat or something goes down and you've got to take it down and re-rig it yourself, if you don't know what you're doing, oof, she, she's hard sort of work. So that's some of the some of the crew. We had one other Kiwi here, didn't we? Oh, God, what was his name again? Anthony. Anthony, that's right. Yeah, he was freaking nuts, man. I loved him to bits. Uh, and there's Peggy. <laughs> permits, oh, wow. please. permits, please. Do you want to talk about Peggy? Man, it's I, I gotta say, Paul, it's great to see your pictures, man. This is like this is incredible. I, I don't I haven't seen a lot of these, so no, I, don't I, mess with Peggy. <laughs> I'm gonna enjoy this. 
<laughs> and uh, Taylor, yeah, she, trip, Taylor's the trip leader. So he, the trip, the buck stopped with Taylor. And uh, that's no mean feat when you're going down a river that of this size and consequence. And, you know, you, as far as everything goes, like legally and, and um, you know, personally, you know, you, you're making the calls that, could potentially put people's you know lives at risk without sort of overdoing it. You you sort of um, there's a bit of a weight there. I don't know how you're feeling right now, Taylor, at this part of the trip. You know, like not having done it before and just having that mantle on your shoulders. What was it sort of like for you this this first time? Oh man, I, you know, it's certainly a lot of nerves. I think you know it's like that nervous excitement of just some big unknown adventure. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot to a lot of responsibility and a lot of things, you know, to account for. And, um, I think, you know, one of the things, I mean, yeah, the trip leader is, it's an important role, obviously, because you've got to, you've got to choose the right people. Um, you know, we, you know, one of the things that's the most critical of this trip, you know, more so than the right gear or the weather or anything else, it's, it's really who you have with you. And, um, you know, these things, you know, having, having people that don't get along can, can really make things go south. And, you know, we, we certainly <laughs> had a little, <laughs> this is we more certainly, a trip in Las Vegas. We, we had some characters, as you can see, the, the, um, yeah, these, these trips are like, they're, they're just really like nothing else. And, and, and having the right people is really what makes it work. Um, you know, like Paul mentioned, there's, a ton of logistics there's a ton of work to do every day uh you just need people that are on the same page and who are you know part of the team and, and really willing to just you know jump in and help and just you know help everybody you know so that we can all have a good time together and you know we we certainly had a little conflict here and there but overall like you know we had an incredible group and you know everybody really you know put put everything they had into it and made it you know what made it a great trip and and, um, you know, you'll see obviously more photos as we go here, but, um, you know, it really comes down to just having good people and, and, uh, you know, that makes the, the role of the, the leader a lot easier. So if you look at that picture there, I'm almost six foot. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like the freaking midget on the trip. These are big, group. strong, capable men. And yeah, we, had, uh, we had all the type A Jackson boys on this trip. Yeah. And so Jackson boys, so Jackson hole is a Mecca for mountain climbers in particular and backcountry skiers and super sort of hardcore outdoorsmen. Um, and it's a Mecca in, in the States for sure for, and attracts those, those kind of men and people. And most of the crew was, was from there. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was, I, I mean, I actually, I don't think a single person in this picture, uh, but albeit and I take it, but one grew up in Jackson, you know, most of us all ended up here via some other, you know, uh, whatever mode of transportation or whatever was a whim in life where we decided we needed to, to move out West. But, um, you know, yeah, the, most of the guys were all part of the, you know, Jackson community and, and most of these guys actually are all still here too. So, um, you know, just, yeah, good, good people. And, and, uh, it's a good place. It attracts some, some really fine, fine people. So, so one thing that's, that stood out for me, and that's part of the reason Taylor reached out to me, cause he, he knew I had a bit of rafting experience, uh, as a guide is, um, is that we didn't actually have a lot of whitewater experience across the entire breadth of the group. We, we had some individuals like JB was pretty on there and, um, oh God, I lost his, lost his name off the top oh. of my head. Was it yeah, actually, actually nobody had any whitewater experience? The only person that knew how to row a boat was JB, and he's a fishing guide. So, like, <laughs> fishing he, guide. so he, sort of like, you know, there's 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 exactly like zero big water whitewater experience in this group right here. Uh, I mean, I and I can't speak to what your experience was, Paul, but no, um, not big, not big water, small water, yeah, river, but not big water. This is a, a unique river and it has its own rating system. You know, a lot of people talk about class one through five or six with when they talk about white water, but the Colorado river system has its own, which is one through 10. And it's uh, unique to the Colorado river. And, and I suppose that that developed just out of a necessity to describe, you know, the, the water and in, in, in this system, because the, the river is just, it's a very unique 
river and and the context of of you know whitewater rivers around the world so um yeah you know it's got its own rating system it's, <laughs> so that speaks they, to they, it all. yeah they grade it one to ten basically most rivers in the world are one to six and so six basically is significant risk of death yeah, um, or essentially like or yeah. completely unrunnable and uh yeah, just to give you a little bit of a taster of some of the kind of water we're going, <laughs> we're going through, uh, it was pretty serious. That is uh, nuts. In the middle there. And these are one-ton, 20-foot boats, you know. And as you, as you can see, like, when I was talking about rafting down in Tasmania on our, on our little sort of 12-foot boats where you've got five people sort of holding oars, doing the engine for you, and you're just a little steering boat at the back, and here you are completely alone with these massive oars and this huge one ton, 20 foot boat and the weight of it. Oh my God. We're moving it around for yeah. this. The oh, physicality yeah, that... of guiding it is nuts. And that's, that's where I got in trouble. So I went to a gym for the first time in my life when I put my hand up to be a guide and I'd never been to a gym in my life. I thought I got to build some muscle. This is nuts. I'm just a skinny little dude. And I got people's lives in my hands and I, and I went a bit too hard and I blew my back out and, um, and I was like, I don't, what am I going to do? What am I going to tell Taylor? I can't move. And I'm meant to be guiding down this trip. And I ended up having to basically pull out of that role uh, and just come as a photographer. It was a bit touch and go there, whether it was a good idea if I should be there with such a specific kind of skill set needed to get down the river. But um, Taylor let me come and and we we threw, um, uh, what was his name in the role? Who'd never done any rafting in his life. <laughs> he ended up, ended up guiding well, we had, one of the we yeah, we had two guys who had never never rode a day in their life, and that was a picture of one of them, uh, Brian. And then um, uh, the other one was uh, was uh, Drew. Anyway, Drew, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the the rowing. You know, the the thing about rowing this river in these big heavy boats is, you know, we I, basically what you're doing is you're steering momentum. You're not actually like maneuvering. Or, or you're not, you're not like, you, yeah, you're not like really rowing the boat so, so much as you are steering the momentum because, you know, these things are heavy. You're, you're moving down the river and, you know, here you can see it's a calm section and, you know, down river Andy's there standing on the boat looking forward at a rapid down river. So you have these like, what, what it's called, what it's, it's what's called a pull and drop river. So you'll have these long stretches of very calm water and then the rapids will generally be formed by debris that has been washed down side canyons. And, you know, part of how the Grand Canyon was formed, in, in, at least in, in what they believe, from my understanding, is that, you know, it's not just the river itself carving through the canyon or the landscape. It's these, you know, massive, like, biblical type events that happen um, with monsoonal, weather and so on where you know you have these massive floods that come down canyons and they push debris into the river they wash out the canyons and then they you know over time will create these you know massive rapids and uh so you have these like very calm sections that lead into these violent falls where the rapids are and mm. you really what you're trying to do is set the boat up to have the most you know direct line through you know, whatever hazard that rapid has. And so it's more about just keeping your boat straight and trying to, you know, keep it from, you know, going into a hole or whatever that might flip your boat. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty wild. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to go back to that. Um, one of my favorite images for this whole trip, Taylor, is, is of you, man. Like, like to me, when I, when I see that image, I reflect back on what I said earlier about, the kind of this is right at the beginning of the trip where none of us have been down this river before except one guy who could hardly remember what was around the corner. We'd found out after we'd agreed to the trip that we were going to have this crazy flood coming through where it was going to turn the trip into God knows what uh, in terms of – and we really had to think about whether we were still going to do it because um, we didn't know the kind of dangers we're going to be facing. You know, Taylor's kind of got the the bottom end line of of you know the buck stops with him if if somebody gets hurt or injured or albeit worse. And um, I, I kind of love that this image just speaks to that for me, man. Like the focus, the the leadership, the um, the kind of mantle of responsibility, I guess that's coming from this trip. 
the fact that you're the one that's got to be looking down the line each day and thinking ahead multiple days and trying to get us all through. And, and as much as you might not have, you know, you don't think it's fair. We're all in that together. I, I really did feel like, you know, ultimately it was, it was your call. You pulled the trip together. You got us all out there. You got the permits. So uh, you made it all happen and, and you were the trip leader. So I think as a portrait, I think this speaks beautifully of that. Um, yeah. That's a great picture, man. I appreciate that, man. Look at that handsome fella. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that was 10 years ago, but that's crazy. Yeah, um, almost 10 years ago. There's a little bit more uh, oh. silver in that beard now, man. Yeah, man, things have changed, but some things remain the same. No, it is, you know, it's a great privilege to be a trip leader on a, on this on this trip. Um, I've now done it twice. I This last trip, I had a permit, so that was, you know, my opportunity to put together a trip again. And, um, you know, it's a cool a cool role to play. Um, obviously I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I loved it. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility, but I think, you know, when you put yourself in that situation, you surround yourself with the right people, you know, that takes a lot of pressure off. I mean, of course there's responsibility and the things that you got to deal with, but, you know, I was perfectly confident in the crew that we had and, you know, all the unknowns going into that, ended up making it actually that much more of an adventure. I think, you know, just to be philosophical a second, right? Like we're, we're all seeking the unknown and adventure. I think that's part of what drives us to, to be photographers. You know, we're looking to go to unique places and see the world and, you know, surround ourselves by beauty and, and adventure and unknown things. And, and so, I mean, this trip is really a, a, a it's totally, I mean, that's like really what that, this trip is. And, um, you know, we, we certainly went into it with not that much experience. And, you know, as we've talked about all these things happen and, you know, we were like kind of wondering whether, you know, are we going to make it? Is it going to be safe? And, and, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and build up to all that. And, you know, when it was all said and done and we got through safely, I mean, it just, it actually, I wouldn't have changed anything like having, too much information and having too much, you know, if we'd have known all the things that we knew before the trip, I mean, it just wouldn't have been the same. And, and I think having that, all that like mystery and adventure that, that, you know, that we, we had for it made it that much better. You know, I think, you know, to, to iterate, reiterate what I said earlier about, you know, this river being the most controlled river in the world this river trip is also one of the most documented, you know, most sought after river trips. I mean, there, you know, there's many, many books, uh, there's guidebooks that will tell you every, you know, how to run every rapid and how to do everything and how to set up your tent and how to deal with your kitchen. And I mean, it's like all of the information is there. I mean, this is not something that is like an unknown or something that people, you know, like, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of mystery left in it if you choose to, you know, do all that research up front. And, you know, there's something nice about showing up in a place, not having as much information as maybe you think you should, because, you know, really we're, we're here for discovery. We're here to like experience the place and, and have this unique, you know, adventure. And, and so, um, you know, I wouldn't change any of it. I mean, having, having, the little experience we did kind of just made it that much more exciting. And, and, uh, you know, it worked out great. Thankfully, nobody, uh, the no, not a lot of carnage and, you know, we all had a great time. Uh, so yeah. I don't know. I won't yeah. completely agree with that, Taylor. There, there was some carnage. There was some carnage. Maybe we'll get to that, but you know, overall, yeah, we we're will, but it, so. so I think, so, I think there, there was an out. Oh, sorry, Ben, you go, man. I was going to say you finished this conversation, but, um, I was just going to say like, as someone who doesn't know you, personally paul like sorry taylor like paul does um i know i'm i'm curious to kind of obviously there's lots of experience and expertise and equipment and to just to get it to this level of stuff um to be able to photograph it and lead it and all that kind of stuff how how did you in your background lead you to this sort of point where 10 years ago or earlier like to be able to do this because obviously someone like yeah. myself i'd have no idea and I'd, there'd be a long long road before i could do something like this myself yeah. how did you kind of how did your journey lead you to that point? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, honestly, like 
so I think all of this started a long time ago, you know, the, the desire to have these types of adventures and, and put yourself out there and do hard things and challenge yourself. And, um, you know, I had been fortunate to do a, a couple of other smaller river trips in the years prior to this. And, you know, I had heard about this trip. And so, you know, I thought, well, hell, if I want to do this, I, I should start putting in because, the sure way to get on this trip is to get a permit. And if you can get a permit, you know, it's like a, if you build it, they will come type situation where, you know, get a permit and then you can plan a trip and you can get a bunch of people together and make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, having some previous trips where I thought, you know, this is really interesting being able to go out and spend multiple days, you know, camping, you know, in a wilderness, uh, running a river. I mean, it's just, there's so much there that was, was incredibly exciting and interesting that to me, it was an obvious decision. Like I've got to pursue this and, you know, to speak of fortune, I, I literally, I put in for the lottery and anybody can do this. You guys can all go sign up. It happens January to February every year. Um, I happen to pull my permit the first year I, played the lottery so i oh wow i won the, I won the lottery that year i should i probably should have bought, bought the powerball instead of the uh grand canyon <laughs> lottery but anyway i yeah i was really lucky to pull that permit and then you know from there it just began you know this whole process of research and trying to figure out you know all these things and you know the outfitters are super helpful um you know in terms of just the the like experience and capability and so forth you know yeah like i don't want to minimize the fact that doing a trip like this and, and putting yourselves in, in this situation there's a lot of risk involved um you know it's dangerous i mean there's certainly no way around that um and you know i i just i feel in, and i still believe and you know this trip is a great example of the you know, if you're capable, if you're a person that, you know, is willing to take some risk and put yourself out there and, you know, do hard things, then, you know, this is a trip that's totally attainable. Um, and, you know, I, I brought people along that I felt comfortable doing this type of thing with and being in these situations with. And, um, you know, so it's, yeah, I mean, there's it, a lot of it is just like having the, you know, desire and, and the will to, you know, kind of make this thing happen. And certainly, you know, being in wilderness and being outdoors, I mean, this is something I've spent my life doing and, and that's just really where I'm comfortable. So, um, you know, aside from being on a boat, you know, learning how to do the things that are specific to rafting, yeah. you know, it's really just another wilderness trip that, you know, is really similar to a lot of other things that we like to do. And so, mm. you know, I just felt like it was in my element and, you know, it was something we had to do. And I, I don't know if that gets to the question, but that sort of hopefully sums up a little bit of it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it just looks it's such a, a mammoth task by the, by the looks of it. And it's yeah, inspiring just to see what you guys managed to accomplish and just um, experience. Um, and so, yeah, no, it's really cool to kind of see how, how you got to that point and um, the sort of things involved along the way. Um, yeah. I'd love to see some of your photos, Taylor, actually, um, if you're happy to, share um obviously yeah. we can supplement with paul's i'll, I'll, um, I'll just speak to i'll just speak to that risk element so yeah because i've been a, a rafter guide for a lot of my life as well so yes there are specific skills about how to read a river how to know how to position a boat how to read the currents in this case in particular the boats are so heavy you can't just steer them when you're in the moment and the rapid you actually need to choose a line and visualize a line before you hit it because you have minimal capacity to move that boat around with that kind of weight and momentum once you're in there. And it, as you can see by some of that water, it's so powerful, you, you don't really have control anyway. Um, so so what was fascinating about this trip to me and what made it a little bit edgy and probably what made it more adventurous is two things. Number one is we had a lot of people that didn't have river experience. But as Taylor had very, very carefully done, he – called in some very 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 capable men they were all fierce outdoorsmen um physically strong like just had the mindset to to take on adventure and new things 
And if the chips are down, they're kind of the, they're the kind of fellas you want on your team or, or or they have your back. So so it made it real adventure for all of us. We're all trying to figure out how the hell to to row, how to navigate the rivers, how to um, you know, read the water ahead, how to work as a team, how to understand all the equipment we had. So there was there was a lot of adventure in terms of figuring it out as we went along. And of course, the greatest adventure at all is you have all these guidebooks that tell you about rapids and give you an idea of which way to go and what level uh, of water. But once the the flood hit, no idea. You could throw that book away. You had rapids turning up that didn't exist before. You had rapids that were meant to be there that were gone. Like the campsites were underwater. Like it was a totally different trip. And it made it an incredibly unknown sort of adventure. And none of us knew what the hell we were going to be facing when that hit. And we didn't even know when the hell it was going to hit. Like we we literally had people stationed at night, like monitoring the the water levels, trying to figure out when it was going to get us. And it literally started rising in the wee hours of the morning. And we had to literally race to get everyone up and out of the campsite before it went underwater itself when it finally hit. So um so I would say, yes, there was a lot of adventure on this trip for a trip that's generally, you know, run commercially by, by a lot of people. And you can get people go down that have no rafting experience at all uh, on a commercial trip without any worries because everyone else is doing it for you. But we didn't have a guide per se. We were doing it ourselves. And you did have to have a person, I believe, Taylor, that has been down the Grand County before in order to get a permit. Um, no, anyway. you actually, you didn't have to have a person that had been, but they, they asked that you had someone who had experience. Oh, and, gotcha. I mean, uh, you, you can just say that, like, they don't, there's no way to verify any of this. So, you know, it was. Oh my God. Really? Like, okay. It's even more an adventure than, but yeah. Nips had been <laughs> down a long time before. I, I don't think his memory uh, he was, was, he was worthless. He was yeah. worthless. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that, but he couldn't remember shit. Yeah, he, was, he was worthless. So every corner was new for all of us. And, you know, that's probably not something that every trip could say on the Grand Canyon. I, I would I would say it's probably fair to say, Taylor, like I don't know how many trips go down where you don't have a person that, you know, knows the river or knows what's going on around the corner. And, and uh, so it was yeah. a big adventure for all of us. I, I think that, you know, back kind of just, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier about just the unknown part of it, like, you know, that is absolutely the case. Like we worked really hard to try to recruit somebody who had a lot of experience because we were all like, well, we need that. And it ended up not happening. And so we were kind of like, well, you know, we'll figure this out. We don't really have the option. And, you know, obviously everything went great. You know, looking back on it now, I'm glad that we didn't have that person because, you know, like I relate to this in my climbing uh, you know, my, I, I'm a rock climber, uh, alpinism, those type of things are really anything that we get into adventure wise, you know, there's guidebooks for everything. Um, and you know, you can pretty much any popular area, you know, with a popular sport like climbing or biking or whatever it is, you know, you can get a book and you can read all about it. And you can, you can know every little detail about that adventure down to, you know, a T and, you know, it, it takes a lot of the mystery out of it. And, you know, I, for one, like some mystery. I like adventure. And if you know too much about a, about a thing, like it sort of takes away that, that, you know, excitement and mystery that I think we're all seeking. So, you know, in a way, yeah, there's like that fine line between having too much information and just enough to like, you know, be able to do it properly and, and really, you know, keep it exciting and, and some, some leave some leave some mystery into it to discover as you go and and so um you know in the end we we just figured it out and that that ended up being one of the the best parts about it is that we 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 didn't have that super experienced person telling us every little thing about every you know turn and rapid and so on so you know we had a lot to, to just discover as a, as a team and and that made it really special. Yeah. Just um, just before you start sharing your photos, I, I think it'd be nice, given we're on a photographic show, to speak about that a bit. So, so when I kind of fell out of that role as a guide, it, it put me more in the position of of having the freedom around photography. And how do you plan a trip down a place that you have no electricity for twenty three days for starters, and you're a digital photographer like Taylor and I spent quite yeah. a bit of time 
trying to plan it and we ended up hiring some marine batteries to charge. Taylor actually took a laptop down and, and a hard drive so we could do a dump partway down the trip. Uh, we had GoPros running. Our boat was the designated media boat, as it were, um, which gave yeah. us a little bit more freedom to to get around. Um, Taylor and I had various kinds of, um, uh, what do you call them, pelly cases. Uh, Taylor had a really big one, which I think was a good idea for uh, storing all your equipment, but we found out quite quickly that having a really big pelly case, you can't keep that up the top of a boat ready to open and get into your stuff. So my main go-to was actually a really small pelly case, which you could, you've probably seen in a few photos, which was just big enough for one camera and one lens. And I had that right under the oars so I could access that at any time the entire time through the trip um, instantly. And I'd literally un, un, unstrap it and loop it over my shoulder and take it out into the canyons and the side canyons with us. So that was my main go-to. So I literally had to make a choice each morning, which, which is my lens for today. And I usually mix between the 24 and a 5 and the 16 35 on a daily basis. And I had a little uh, little oh, Olympus uh, Tough that I had as a waterproof camera that I had sort of in a pocket with me the entire time. Um, I had another sealed, kind of double sealed sort of set of bags that I had other equipment that I could potentially access with a little bit more time, not too far away. But um, what was your sort of mindset around, you know, obviously, Taylor, you had your roles being the leader. It didn't give you as much freedom, I guess, to shoot as I had, but um you put a lot of thought into it and you probably learned a lot since about how to manage a trip like this photographically. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's tough to be out in the field that long. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of things to consider. Um, and 10 years ago, that was a different, a lot. Well, it was a different conversation to some, in some context than it was, you know, now because, a lot of things have changed. The technology has advanced in ways that maybe make it a little bit more efficient or easier to, to deal with. But, uh, you know, in the scheme of things, you know, it's, it, there's still a lot of the same issues that you have to deal with power being one of them, um, you know, managing images, how do you, you know, make sure that you've got, you know, everything protected. Um, yeah. Lots of logistics. Uh, you know, we, for this trip, given that it was the first time I had done this, I certainly was a lot more, you know, I, I felt like I put a lot more effort into trying to photograph it, even though I was also the trip leader, you know, I really wanted to document it as much as I could too. So, you know, we really, really put a lot of effort into that. And like Paul mentioned, we had some video as well. And um, we, you know, had GoPros, we had multiple SLR, DSLR cameras, and we ended up taking a battery that actually, I think it, I don't think it lasted as long as we had hoped it would, but, uh. um, you know, we had laptops. So we were like downloading images and managing footage and trying to archive files. And I mean, it was just a lot of logistics from a digital tech standpoint uh, that, you know, it's a harsh environment. Sand gets in everything. You know, luckily we didn't have much you know, harsh weather. So, you know, we weren't dealing with like rain per se, but, but you obviously you're in a boat, so you got water to deal with. And, um, you know, as Paul said, it was just a matter of having, you know, some Pelican cases, and, you know, really bomb proof dry bags that we could pack everything in and, you know, manage stuff on the boat when we were on the river. And then, you know, then when you're off river, you're, you know, setting up your, you know, your personal sleeping area. And then we'd have our own little stash of, you know, uh, equipment where we would, you know, clean up a spot or whatever and make sure it's like, you know, easy to work in and not getting sand in our, in our, in our gear and trying to, you know, manage to keep things clean. And so that we could, yeah, like just keep our equipment operating and in good shape. And, you know, that's just, it's a harsh environment. So that's, uh, it's not something that's easy to, to deal with. And, uh, you know, the, the first, this trip, um, you know, like, because we were doing, all of the things like we said, like managing, downloading, like that really was probably the logistically the most difficult part because it takes a lot of power to do that. Um, you know, 10 years ago, transferring images was a lot slower. Um, you know, putting them on hard drives, all that, all that technology was actually quite a bit slower and would take quite a bit more power. Uh, you know, more recently, those things have gotten way more efficient with, you know, uh, solid state drives, 
Um, the battery technology is better. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's just, there's, it's a lot more efficient now. So in a way, maybe it's a bit easier, but you still have the same challenges, you know, being in a harsh environment just requires, you know, attention to detail and taking care of your equipment. So, you know, these are, these are issues that are, you know, like you just have to look at the trip and the conditions you're going to deal with and, and try to plan as best you can to manage it. And, you know, I don't know that there's any one trick other than just like really being thoughtful about your workflow and how you're trying to deal with, you know, the challenges of the, the technology uh, in, in the environment that, you, that you're in. And so, um, you know, I felt like we did a pretty good job of it. And uh, the, the unique thing that I took actually, so on this, as we said on this trip, we were doing a lot of downloading, managing stuff. We didn't really, I don't really recall like spending a lot of time, like going through images because hmm. obviously the more you're, you know, browsing images and using your computer, the more power you're going to use. So, you know, we're trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, my last two trips, I actually elected to not even take a computer. And instead, I just took a bunch of batteries and a bunch of memory cards. And I just, I just photographed and I didn't burden myself with looking at images or downloading or, you know, dealing with the logistics of that because mm. it, it just, it requires, you know, more power, more, more equipment. And yeah. obviously there's a bit of risk factor involved. Like if you lose a camera or a memory card or something, mm. you know, that then you're risking losing your images. And, you know, these are, I guess these are just decisions you have to make about how you're going to deal with it. Um, and and it's just kind of two cards. So you got to back up that kind of thing. You know, I'm not as, <laughs> I'm probably not as uh, thorough in some regards. I, I don't really use multiple cards. Yeah. Um, I just use really high quality, you know, SanDisk. I've got these, you know, really yeah. nice SanDisk cards and yeah. I've never really had too many problems with them. So, yeah. um, you know, I just found it easier to, to try to, mm. you know, just keep it lighter and keep the, you know, the biggest thing really was power. Like, if you're trying to do all this stuff and you're doing a lot of media heavy stuff, obviously you need a lot of power and that really is the bottleneck. Yeah. So the less yeah. stuff you're operating, the less power you need. Yeah. And I found on these other, you know, recent trips that it was just easier to, to just make sure I had enough batteries. You know, the, the, that's another thing about the cameras and the efficiency of power. Like, yeah, I'm sure that the cameras I was shooting on this 2014 trip, ran through batteries a lot quicker than the cameras that I'm shooting now, even though I'm using mirrorless, mm. you know, overall they're just more efficient. And so I've just found it better to, you know, in these intense environments, whether, you know, not this, just this trip, I mean, this goes with all the trips that I do. Um, you know, I just try to keep it as minimal as possible so that you, you have less, you know, less bottlenecks, less things that can go wrong. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and sure. you just make sure that you're maximizing your, your, you minimize as much of the, the exposure to, you know, losing or messing something up as possible in regards to maximizing, you know, the efficiency, right? So it's like finding that balance so that you, you know, you can be in the trip and be responsive to the situation and not be burdened by equipment and other things that, you know, might, might ruin the shoot. Yeah. So there's my little, uh, my little orange pelly case, which is my total savior. Um, the big trade-off really is safety versus accessibility. So if you really pack your yeah. stuff well and you want to have it packed well, because if that boat flips, the, the, it's got the physical capacity to, uh, that river to rip everything off your boat. Um, and so, and of course, you've got so much gear here. You, the, the ability to have things accessible, you can open and close is really limited. So I chose a kind of more lightweight approach. This was my other bag, which had my other equipment, which was double bagged. Uh, and this was my main kind of case here on the right where I had my main sort of camera. And then in my pocket, I'd, I'd have um, uh, my Mew and on my head or just on, on my ch chest, I'd have the GoPro. So so that was kind of my kit. And uh, if I did it again, Taylor, it'd be the same. I wouldn't bother taking a computer and download things. So I just, cards are a lot yeah. bigger, cameras last longer. But you don't have solar power, particularly in winter, Um 
and with such high wall canyons, so you can't rely on that either. So you really are heavily relying on, on batteries and just managing that. And it was yeah. a real unknown to Taylor and I. We'd never done it before. You know, three and a half weeks is a freaking long time. Uh, in fact, it's the longest wilderness adventure I've actually ever done up to that date, and I've done a lot. So, so I really hadn't had hadn't had to manage my camera equipment like like the time before so it, it was something i spent a lot of time thinking about and yeah. the marine battery really helped the peace of mind of being able to download images part way through also helped because at least i knew some of it was backed up and you would have that edge going down without doing a dump of like oh what if i lose everything or what if you know and you can literally could lose everything and um yeah so well, i actually uh i flipped the boat in a river uh a year or so before this trip and lost, uh, you know, the full rig, camera, memory card, everything. So oh, wow. oh. Uh, it, has, it has happened. Um, nice. You know, that's just, these things happen, you know, it's just part of, part of doing this stuff. And, um, you know, you're trying to minimize those things from happening, obviously, but, you know, the main thing in that situation was that everybody was okay. And, you know, all we did was lose a camera. Um, it could have been a lot worse. So, um, you know, yeah, it's just it's part of the adventure. We should um we should start having a look at some of your images, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah, so I let me see, I'm gonna just I'll do a screen share here and I'm just gonna pull up some images as they as they kind of um uh as they come. I mean I, I grabbed a few here. I've actually got here in my Lightroom all three of my trips highlighted and can you see you guys see them now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually quite interesting when you kind when you look at three trips together because there's so much overlap and yet there's also so many things that are different. And obviously the canyon doesn't really change. I mean, 10 years is a millisecond in the scheme of things down there. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, what changes is 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 me and you know, life and what's happening and the time of year and you know th those sort of things so um it's actually kind of fun to you know have have been asked to to do this and, and you know really look back at these pictures and you know i didn't put them together in, in necessarily the form of a presentation I, I just grabbed stuff that sort of jumped out to me as i was peeling through and and mm -hmm. you know i've got thousands of images i mean it's this is such a massive trip it's really hard to even know where to begin um when trying to, you know, pull images or tell a story, but, um, I, you know, there's some fun stuff here and I thought, you know, it would help. You know, we could just jump into a few of them and, and sort of talk about, uh, you know, different scenarios and what's going on and kind of, um, you know, let that lead to the next thing. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you, you know, in terms of landscape, I mean, this, Have you guys got full screen talent to hit the F button. That? Hit the F button and go full screen for us. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, I mean, the, you know, this is obviously a landscape podcast. And, um, you know, I was telling Paul before that, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a, a landscape photographer, but my, you know, I, I kind of, my sweet spot is really like people in the landscape. And, you know, I do a lot of different things in photography. And so, I always look at the landscape as, you know, really a character in the story that I'm telling. And obviously there's other parts of that story. You know, this image is, you know, showing the camp and this beautiful place. And, um, you know, this was a long exposure. You can see, um, you know, the river there being, um, you know, getting that nice, you know, flow of water, um, you know, using, using some of that technique and um, capturing some of the light in the foreground from the boys at camp. Um, you know, I, I just, yeah, this is one of my favorite images of, of sort of the camp scene. And it kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, what that looks like there. You know, the, it's an extraordinary camping trip. You know, like you you pull up to these beautiful beaches and sandbars and you have these incredible, you know, open areas that uh, are at the base of canyons or whatnot. You know, the, it, it changes throughout the trip, obviously. But, um, you know, it's just a really, really incredible uh, place to be. Um, this is a another long exposure in the moonlight. You know, this is probably like midnight, um, and so this is you know just uh, exploring. You know, playing with long exposure. Whoa, sorry, my my things going too quickly here. That's no, um, all right. 
this is one of the more famous overlooks. Um, you know, when you see pictures of the Grand Canyon uh, from the river trips perspective and you, you know, do research on it, this is, you know, one of the, the famous spots that you'll see. And yeah, um, it's called Nankawi. And um, so this is kind of a famous thing. And this is, you know, in landscape photography, we probably deal with this a lot. I mean, especially if you live in a national park, mm -hmm. you know, we go to places that are just photographed endlessly mm -hmm. and everyone has an interpretation of it. And, you know, we just have these iconic, you know, locations and, and this happens to be one of them. And there's a few fun pictures actually I can pull up from this spot and it might be fun to just compare them. Let me see if I can find the other one. Um, well, I think that there's some uh, definite, and I did put a lot of thought into this, like you're going down a Canyon and as you can see, like the level of contrast you're dealing with is really significant. Mm. So you, that, that's people. one of the more complex things that you've got to deal with for trip. You either, either isolate an element of what you're trying to capture or you or go down the brave route like Taylor is here and, and see how big is the dynamic range on your camera. The beauty uh, of modern cameras, hey, especially yeah. if you're, yeah, it's just really nice to be able to pull up those shadows. I, lo I love that middle image. I want both those, those, the middle image and the one on the right, that kind of light yeah. coming through is gorgeous. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, these were some of my favorite really. pictures of this, uh, of this location. And, mm. you know, this was, I think uh, you can see in the one on the left here, that was actually sunset the evening before. Yeah. And then these other two are obviously sunrise and, mm. um, I, there, there, to me, there's something really nice about this perspective and this time of day that I just, you know, I love. And, you know, obviously, yeah, the, the dynamic range of these cameras now is extraordinary. Um, you know, the light that you get in this place is just so unique because you have these massive walls. So like Paul was saying, you get this incredible contrast and it almost becomes a bit of a game of, you know, you, you can't plan for light. You, it's not, it's not like, a lot of places where you know we might visit as a landscape photographer and we we have a lot of control because you know maybe uh, i don't maybe control is not the right word but we can we can certainly plan for where the light's going to be and you know we have all the apps and all the ways to like you know approach a location and, and really think about photographing it and and here in the canyon you know we're you're constantly moving the light's changing you know you can have incredible light at noon in the canyon because you get this like epic you know shadow and light play because mm. of the, the direction of you know the river and the way that the canyon walls you know uh, refract and you know direct the light and so you know it, it, it's almost like this game throughout the trip of you know trying to find you know interesting ways to work with that light and, mm. and really embrace it because you know, it's not like you can just stop and be like, all right, I'm going to wait for this place, you know, for the light to change and, and for the sun to be in a, in a better place. I mean, you're, you're literally moving through this landscape constantly. So, yeah. you know, you kind of get what you get and yeah. you don't have the you know, luxury becomes, of yeah, planning. Yeah. You don't yeah. have that luxury to stop and just wait. Um, totally. so the nature of the trip. Yeah, and no, it, it really changes every, every bend around the corner. It's different. And what I really enjoyed about the Canyon, this is a good example of it is, is the the canyon walls are like reflectors for you, so they yeah. just throw all this light and it wraps around different sort of subjects and different elements of things. That so it's kind of it, once you learn the game, you can just lean into it and sort of use the light as your friend, as opposed to what you'd initially feel like and just going, "Oh my god, how am I going to deal with this crazy contrast the whole time?" Yeah. Just kind of lean into it and work with it. And the advantage now, particularly ten years later. <laughs> <laughs> from my trip as a dynamic range is so much better on, on single shots, but um, it was certainly a challenge. You know, there's an example of just, you know, the, you, you're talking about 14, 13, 14, 15 stops of light, like all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. And, you know, there's no way around it. You have to embrace it. And so, you know, you find yourself like, you know, I'm very, because of my, you know, most of what I do with photography includes people in it in some way. And so when I'm shooting a, an image like this with the landscape, I'm very, you know, something I guess that I really pay attention to. And I mean, obviously we all should is composition and, you know, what's what we're trying to say with an image, how we're placing the subject in the frame. And, you know, this is a great example. 
you know, the, if, if, the, if the boat was slightly more into the shadow or slightly in a different position, you know, you might not see the outline or the silhouette of the people. And it would just, you know, kind of, to me, take away from that scenario. And, and so I'm always really mindful about how I'm placing, you know, the, the people or the action or whatever it is in the frame. And, you know, in this scenario, you know, you've got this really contrasty, you know, situation. And, and so it just like makes sense to, you know, work with it in this way. And, and you, you know, kind of create, you know, what I think is a, a much more interesting image by, you know, how, how you place the subject. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just the way they're sitting in the middle of that reflection just pops them out so much as a nice little focal point. Um, and totally. they're just, you know, just split second things um, that like, yeah, a lot of landscape photographers aren't moving, like dealing with such, you know, moving subjects a lot of the time, like in landscape photography, a lot of it is you've got the static landscape and you're waiting for the light or whatever it is. The most sort of movement is cloud or whatever. Um, yeah. Whereas when you're dealing with yeah people and boats and all that kind of stuff, it's that whole other dynamic where when they're the subject, you've got to be very mindful of timing and things yeah. that happen. You've got maybe space of two seconds um, and then that's that's it. It's gone otherwise. Well, even um, more yeah. than the river, and the thing is you, you've also, you've got this trade-off, like there's a rapid coming up and the light's good. Like how, how, how long do you hold on to your camera for to get the shot? Yeah. And, how, and that's a good example. How late do you leave it till, till you finally chuck it out of the pelly case and how good are the seals on the pelly, <laughs> pelly case as well? Yeah. Yeah. Is it strapped in properly? Like it's up to you how far you push it, um, which is, and so going through the middle of stuff, you know, that's where GoPros come in or, or, you know, little cameras like, and lip is tufts and things that, that you know are going to be 100 percent waterproof regardless. Um, you just gotta like hold on to them. Yeah. Uh, what's happening here, Taylor? This is a different trip. You you're were you in a boat or on the on the on the land? On um, this one, I'm probably on shore. Um, and so yeah, I mean, there's we're gonna I'm gonna start piecing in images from other trips here. Um, awesome. And you know, yeah, these are just like a few. You know, it's funny. So we use the same outfitter on my second trip that we used on my first trip. And you can tell that because of the boats, right? The color. So you can almost look at a lot of our pictures like yes, these types, trips. and you wouldn't know. Um, and then this last trip, we used a different one. So we had blue boats and I actually kind of did that on purpose. Cause I wanted some, I wanted some photos with different color boats. Um, yeah. But, you know, I also wanted to try a new outfitter. Um, but yeah, like that speaks to what I was saying earlier about, just like the overlap and how like you can look at these photos and like there's things that are that sort of remain the same and then there's stuff that you know obviously is very different so uh it's just kind of a fun thing that for me to, to look at from that perspective um you know to the gear point we were talking about uh, multiple times i know people love to think about gear you know this was kind of my setup at, at one of my camps um i had multiple dry bags i have a uh we had a small solar battery pack that we would use when you know when we could charge it it's that goal zero um sherpa mm -hmm. thing um you know i just used the pelican case so you know keep all the lenses keep the cleaning kit keep the you know main stuff you know here and this is what we would use at night i'd, I'd set this up around my you know th this stuff over here on the right side of the frame is is actually my my sleeping area and um and so i would just kind of each night, you know, manage the kit, make sure everything's clean, uh, you know, dusting images, They're obviously sand everywhere. So you're always trying to keep your lenses clean. Um, and, you know, this other dry bag back here is the one that's set on the deck uh, that I would keep my cameras in during the day so that I could get the things really quickly. You know, like Paul said, you know, stuff gets rigged and it's hard to get to. So, you know, if, you're, if you wanna make pictures, you gotta be able to get your stuff really quickly. And so that becomes a bit of a challenge. Like, how do you manage, you know, keeping the gear protected when it needs to be, but yet being able to get to it efficiently to make some quick pictures. And, and so you really have to like dial your system in and kind of figure out how to manage all that. And, you know, after a few days, it, it really starts to flow. And, um, and so, yeah, that's just a little bit of a brief look at, you know, the equipment. I mean, again, this is nothing crazy. It's fairly simple, a small Pelican case and a couple of dry bags. And, you know, just trying to like keep a minimal footprint so that, you know, you don't have a lot of stuff to deal with. What's your, what's your focal length um, or lens kit, Taylor? Has that changed over the years or? You know, I'm currently, I mean, I'm using Nikon mirrorless um, 
I just upgraded to the Z8. It's incredible. Um, I, um, I've always been an icon shooter. Um, I love the ease of using zoom. Yeah. (laughs) I love the ease of of zoom lenses. Um, you know, the 70 to 200 two eight is one of the best lenses ever made. They're incredible. And they, I feel like they've gotten even better with the mirrorless, uh, you know, technology. Um, that's what is laying on the top of the case here. Um, I use the 24 to 70 to a lot, uh, but I, I really love prime lenses too. Uh, but you know, in these types of trips, um, I, I think I use pretty much exclusively the, the two, a zoom lenses just because, you know, the, the environment we're in, the way that we're moving, the, you know, being responsive, I, I just, because of the way that I'm shooting a lot, especially with trying to capture a lot of action, those zoom lenses are really nice and it just makes it a lot easier to, you know, be, to have that versatility and focal length for, you know, whatever you're shooting at the moment. Um, but, you know, if I, if I could slow things down and I have my choice, I love using prime lenses because they're just sharper. And, you know, I love shooting wide open, especially with portraits because you get that bokeh and I mean, that's like a really nice effect. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It kind of just depends on, you know, I guess what we're, what we're doing at the time, but, you know, I, I certainly find myself being lazy and reverting to the zoom lenses because uh, it's just easier to manage, you know. Um, oh, it's just it's so, it's just functional on a trip like this. You don't have a lot of room to bring your whole kit. So yeah. have the most versatile kit. But I was just wondering, like, between the three trips, did you change up the kind of lenses or focal lengths that you tried out? You know, no. I think, honestly, like, I probably shot really similarly – uh, across all the trips using the same type of glass. It was more like the cameras, the actual cameras changed just because from 10 years ago, I, would, I believe, I, forget, I can't even remember which camera I had on our first trip. I know I had like a... Probably 810 a, maybe or 800? No, it was pre yeah. that. I think it was oh, like a 700 or... Oh, I don't seven. even, honestly, I don't... Oh, you know what? I guess I could look in the uh, metadata here in our handy light room. Um, yeah, so it would have been the 750, 750 and, the D, and the D4, and then yeah. the, the, the other trip, five D4 years would have been a chunky camera to take. Yeah, it was, but you know, it's a good camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the middle trip five years ago would have been the 850, and then mm. this last trip I was shooting the Z7. So, yeah, and here's all the glass I had. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all 70 to 200, 24 to 70. 80 to 400. 24. So. Oh, I remember you just bought that 80 to 400. You bought it on the trip and you'd hardly use it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think Nikon gave me that lens for that trip. Mm. Um, and it's nice, but it's not as sharp. You know, that, that four. There's always going to be a yeah, compromise in sharpness yeah. with the range that big. Hey. Um, yeah. That, I think that that's, the zoom lenses are great, but they do compromise a little bit in terms of that. And, um, and so, you know, that's a choice you have to make. But I, yeah, I love prime glass when I can use it because of the sharpness. So, um, you know, if you've got the, you know, ability to carry that, you know, then that's that's a good way to go. But, you know, it's just well, like what, that. Same what primes issue. are in a perfect world? What primes would you want access to down the canyon? Oh, man. I mean, obviously, you need a wide lens that, you know, 24. Um I love the 50, 35. I mean, I, I, again, I think it's having the full range because I'm shooting all kinds of stuff from, you know, big wide, you know, here's an incredible big wide landscape that was probably 24. Yeah, this is epic. You know, there was like oh, a sandstorm. Nice. We had this cool weather. Um, and then, uh, you know, then it's like shooting macro stuff, um, details in the desert. So, I mean, the, the thing about this trip is, there's just so much that you can do. It becomes almost like a yeah. a challenge to like, okay, how do I like, how do I like put some put some boundaries on myself to 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 make photos? Because you know you can shoot wide shots all day, or you can you know sh- focus on just you know certain aspects of the landscape, or you can get in close like this, and or you know you can shoot the action. You know, it's like there's just so much going on and I, I literally kind of had to like, you know, pull myself back from the situation and be like, or that day and say, okay, well like today I'm going to focus on, you know, shooting some macro. And I, 
I put my 50, I have a little lightweight 50 macro that, that I, that I like using is that new Z lens from Nikon. It's, you know, very small. And I'd go around and make pictures like this because, you know, it was just like, stop looking at the big stuff and get in and look at the intimate small details. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of a fun way to, 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 you know, you know, challenge yourself and, and try to find new ways of seeing this like extraordinary place. Cause I mean, it's just as incredible up close as it is pulled back looking at the landscape. Yeah. I don't think I've been, I've been anywhere where so many focal lengths can be applicable to exactly the same place at any time. Yeah. It's like at the whole way you could shoot an eight mil, you could shoot, you know, 12, you could shoot 16, 14, you could be, on a 400 zoom in, you could be shooting macro from just about any single place in the canyon the entire time, like just under your feet. As being, speaking of which, uh, there's just so much complexity and variety to to the scope of what's present. Plus, you've got the yeah. whole narrative of, of people and the storytelling, the adventure. It's it is quite overwhelming, but I think what's beautiful about being on such a long journey, and you might alliterate to this, Taylor, is you actually have a bit of time to slow down and be present with just certain things or just be with one lens for a day or just look at details for a day or just work on action for a day because 23 days, it's, it's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and it's not very yeah. often on a journey that we, we you can actually just be quite singular for periods of time um, and feel a little bit of freedom around that. Yeah. I, I find, you know, and this is like in photography in general, but it's in, it's, it's in everything really in our lives. Like I'm paralyzed when I have too many choices, right? Like it's like, well, I can, I've got this incredible camera and I've got all these lenses and now I'm like, all right, I'm going to go out and make some incredible images. But you literally, you get into a situation like this where everything is beautiful and you're just like, oh my God, like, what do I, what do I do? Like, which lens do I, which lens do I use? The light's changing. Should I go close? Do I pull back? Like what, you know, you've got like all these options and in a way that can, that can really just get in your way. And I think it, you know, it's, there's something nice about simplifying things and, you know, just saying, all right, today I'm going to shoot with a 50 or today I'm going to shoot landscapes with the 70 to 200 and, you know, shoot everything long or whatever it is. Right. And, and really just like, you know, push that noise away about, you know, trying to capture everything and, and just focus on, you know, a few variables and, and embrace that. And, you know, that can, I think that can be a great exercise. Um, I well, actually I, uh, took me a while for the noise to settle, I have to say, um, but I, I took it pretty seriously. I was really self-conscious Taylor, if you don't remember that, I, that I, I blew my back out and I wasn't in a position to be a guide. And I was like, okay, I'm coming as the photographer. And so I was literally, you know, up till one, two in the morning, shooting every night, the first few days, just trying to think, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to work my ass off here. And as much as I'm talking about the freedom on a trip like this, you're a working member of the trip. And I found out quickly, quickly from some of the feedback from the boys that <laughs> he's this guy running around taking photos, but he should be working on the campsite or loading a boat. And I was like, I had to pull my head back in pretty quick. And, Re get myself back as a working member of the team because logistics are, are hours every day of just managing equipment and setting up camps and downloading and uploading all the equipment from the river and that kind of thing. So, but going back to that point, like to specialization as, as Taylor's going through these beautiful kind of intimate specialized images is by the end of the trip, all that noise was gone. And I yeah. found myself in a space where I was just like, I'm just going to shoot at 200 mil all day. And I'm like, Oh my God, it was beautiful. Yeah. And one day, yeah, I mean, like, I even put the camera away and I said, screw this, I want a day without the camera. And I jumped in one of the kayaks and spent the day in the kayak not shooting at all. Yeah. And I actually needed I mean, that, that. Yeah. I think that goes without saying on any trip. You know, we, I'm sure we all go into whatever situation and we're like, you know, we spent all this money, we committed all this time, and now we've got to, like, produce and work and, like, try to, like, interpret this. And, like, we, you know, I think as creative people, we, you know, push ourselves and, you know, that anxiety creeps in and you're just like, man, am I maximizing this? Am I getting it? Like, you know, we're, there's also that component, like I want to make this as beautiful as possible so that, you know, we can share this and people will celebrate it. And like, you know, there, you know, there's a vanity aspect of it, right? Like we're, you know, let's be honest, we're photographers. We want people to love what we do. So 
you know, we, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to, you know, maximize every single opportunity. And then, and then when we don't, we're hard on ourselves about, Oh shit, we, you know, we should have, or we, you know, missed it. I mean, I know I, I go through that constantly. Um, and you know, it's, it's just hard to turn that off. Um, but you know, on a trip like this, because you have so much time, I think you, you give yourself space to work through that. And then you, you know, you find your flow and, and you can, you know, you know, make pictures as, you know, as you're inspired and, um, you know, to what Paul was saying about the work and, you know, having, you know, having a responsibility to the team, you know, from my standpoint with these trips, you know, I'm rowing a boat, I'm the trip leader and I want to be a photographer and there just simply isn't space to be all those things, you know, as like maybe, um, you know, like, like comprehensively as you want to be right like you know you can't you just can't do everything all the time and one of the beautiful things about Paul and I's trip is that you were there with that capacity to just be the photographer and it, it was, for me it was there were points where I was a little envious in that you know I had all this responsibility and you could just kind of be there and interpret what you were seeing and, and it was a lovely balance because you know I knew that you know you had this incredible eye and you were you know really thoughtfully you know, putting time and effort into telling the story of the trip and capturing what you saw. And, and it, it really was a, a lovely, like, you know, uh, collaboration for all of us because, you know, we, you know, I would also take photos and then we would call it, you know, we would sort of like collaborate on how to photograph certain scenarios. And, you know, we pulled a, pull the boat ashore and let the boys run the rapids and we'd all set up and take different angles. And, um, and so it was really fun to, have that, you know, collaborative aspect of it on our trip. Um, and, and then, you know, other, in a, a lot of other instances, there was plenty of times where I wanted to be photographing, but I couldn't because it was just, you know, something that was you know going on. So, um, you know, yeah, it's like a give and take and, and you just have to manage, you know, being present and, you know, doing the, you know, taking photos when you can, being a team member when you have to be, and, you know, being safe and, you know, it's just, yeah, a lot of things to, to do. And I, 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 after now having done several of these trips, you know, I've always rowed a boat. I probably wouldn't do this trip without rowing a boat just because it's such a, a wonderful challenge and such a fun thing to do. Um, but there are definitely times where throughout the trip, I've been like, man, it would be nice just to be sitting on the boat and not be rowing so that I could be photographing and, and just concentrating on making images. Um, and so I, I find that I think about that, but you know, like, I'm not sure that I would actually want to do that. I mean, it's hard to say. Oh, because... I was wondering if you might've taken that role on future trips. Cause, cause I was quite aware of that sort of compromise and, I sort of yeah. put extra pressure on. I, I knew it was a privileged position that I was in, so I, I it made me work sort of all, all the more all the harder, to be honest, because I I recognised that you're right over my shoulder without the same freedom that I had, and and I was sort of conscious of that. So I thought, damn, I'm going to do a, a hell of a good job here. Yeah, uh, just just in rep, just an acknowledgement of that, I guess, because particularly when I thought originally I was going to be one of the guides and and I wasn't going to have that space. So uh, that dichotomy between the two of us so i really appreciated your sort of grace and support and um and when, realizing when at times it would have, it would have been a bit frustrating for you not having that sort of freedom but uh so it's interesting that you've made that choice on consecutive trips that you that you've lent into that um that guiding and, and leadership and, and rowing role as as the kind of the star and not sort of gone gone the other way and taking a trip down just as a shooter well, you, you can you yeah. never just be just a shooter. You're a team member and you've got to be a player, but there's a lot to do. But yeah. it's quite different if you're not managing <laughs> managing rowing of a boat or, or or being a trip leader for sure in terms of your headspace as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, I, I again, I think I wouldn't trade it. I mean, I love being the, in the leadership role. It's it's a great challenge. I've, I've done a trip where I wasn't and it was nice to let someone else do it. Um, you know, rowing the boat is you know, that's one of the big, that's really one of the biggest responsibilities because you're dealing with your, your equipment and your team. And, um, and that, you know, that's a great fun thing to do. And, you know, I just, I don't know that I could relinquish that, but, um, 
it sure would be fun sometimes just to be the guy behind the camera. And, and uh, you know, we, it was sure nice to have you doing that, you know, during our trip, because I mean, there's just so many things that happen that are hard to, you know, you, you just can't do it if, if you're not the one with the camera. And, and I'm sure that was a lot of fun for you. And, and it was sure appreciated because, you know, you got some beautiful images and, you know, here we are sharing them and, and it's, it's great to see some of them again. I mean, there's, I'm sure you have pictures that I haven't even seen. So it, it's kind of lovely to, uh, to see a few of these popped up that you shared earlier. Yeah. It's, um, I reckon at some stage soon we, we should, uh, I feel like making the trip a little more real for people and uh, maybe speaking about some of the experience of, of what it is actually rowing the boat and some of the challenges that you're kind of facing, like, um, so I'd love to, I reckon we should tell a story about Crystal at some stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, I, just, I've got, here's a, yeah, yeah, go for it. Here's a, I mean, here's a good picture. Like I'll see if I can uh, zoom in. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've found, like, I think from my standpoint of, you know, capturing this trip, you know, on all three of these trips, we've got a lot of great images from you know, from the boats and these calm sections from the shore of some of this, like this picture to me, I think is great. Like the, this is um, upset rapid. Uh, the lighting was incredible. And I just, I had to make sure that I captured it because, you know, it, like it was one of those things that we were talking about earlier. You never know what you're going to get. You come around the corner and the, the sun's hitting a certain way and, you know, whatever time of day you happen to be there. And, you know, this just, the light was extraordinary at this particular you know, time that we landed here. And I was like, look, guys, you guys run the rapid. I totally trust you. I'm going to get on shore and get pictures of this. And, and so we just got these like beautiful, beautiful shots with this cool backlight and the, the angle that, that, you know, that it had as these guys were, were running this rapid. And, you know, this is a pretty major rapid. And, you know, this gives a good idea of the intensity, though, what I found is the perspective from the shore, it, it, you never really can quite capture the intensity of these rapids. It, it's, it's very difficult. And I still haven't fully solved that yet. I think part of it might be, you know, or one solution might be having someone in the raft on the front with a GoPro on a selfie stick or something, taking pictures as you go through, you know, getting that wide angle close up perspective. Um, so maybe that's something we'll try on the next trip, but you know, the, the it, it's really a difficult thing to translate like the intensity of the river, the size of these rapids and just, you know, how, how wild it is. Um, so that's something I'm tr still trying to solve. Um, that's, so maybe uh, that's, that's pretty more than I was expecting. Did, did you have a bit of a flood element on this trip as well? Cause that's, um, because normally, like, we had this crescendo of almost like a sine wave where we had a week of, you know, of the beautiful crystal clear kind of waters and regular kind of levels. And then we had a week in the middle of just horrendous, dark, like, storm sort of sea conditions of, of massive flooding waters. And then we had another week where it slowly settled and went into its crystal sort of period. And here you are sort of on another trip with some pretty dynamic water going on. What, what was your situation? Yeah, like? so one of the things, I mean, this is actually, we had fairly kind of typical levels on this last trip. Um, and the water, it's more often than not that the water is very turbid like it is here. So you get this, a lot of sediment, it's very brown. Um, and, you know, this is just a matter of runoff coming into the river, the pariah, some of the other uh, tributaries that come in when they run, they, they push a lot of sediment, sediment into the river. So, you know, this is actually kind of a normal level um, yeah. at this point. In fact, I think it's probably about the same as when we, we, I would guess it's about the same as when we ran it 10 years ago. Um, but it certainly looks similar and, you know, it's hard to sort of tell, like that's, that's another point to the perspective, right? Like, you know, this by all accounts looks like it might've been the flood stage, but you know, it, it's not. And, you know, this is, uh, that's something that, you know, it, it's just really hard to get perspective. The place is so big. And so it's like, how do you, how do you really capture that? Um, and that's part of the challenge too. And that's, what's fun of, you know, for me now of going back several times, um, you know, I'm looking at it, like, how can I, 
how can I capture something different? Even though it's really familiar, I'm, I'm now back and I've got, you know, the perspective of having done it before, you know, what can I do differently this time? How can I show it in a, you know, in the, in the way that it is now and, you know, maybe make some new pictures that I haven't made before. And I think that's, uh, you know, we're gonna have a good that's, a challenge with any, that's a challenge with any location that we go to multiple times, you know? Well, I think uh, there's a specific set of challenges to going down a river like this because you can't access the land a lot of the time at all. Right. And there's only specific places that you have the potential to actually shoot a, a boat going past because there's complexities with, well, how do you catch up with a boat if it's gone ahead? They might not have a place to stop to pick you up. And and so you got to have a lot of prevision, like Taylor's shown, to even think about how to set up a shot like this. And you also need to have the... Um, the support of your crew <laughs> because um if they're not into it it's not going to happen because they're involved in you know picking you up or, or giving you the time and space to go do that yeah so, you, you let me share screen for a second i'm going to um if you i'm going to just show some some shots of that particular rapid that i think kind of do start picking speaking to just what you're talking about in terms of the um the power of the river and and you know what it what it sort of is capable of doing so this is kind of coming into crystal. I'll come back a bit. So you go past Phantom Ranch, which is kind of the middle part of the trip, and that's the only place you can get out. <laughs> if you want to if you do the 5,000-foot ascent, there's a whole set of mule train going up there doing it. And when we came into this river, like the flood had just hit. We really didn't know what the hell we we're going to be dealing with. Um, it was already what was called a grade 9 out of 10 rapid. Um, here's, there is another person on the front of this boat, by the way. Uh, this is JB doing the, doing the first run. This is probably the gnarliest rapid in the whole, uh, that we kind of went through on the whole trip really, but this is the one that completely toasted Taylor and I suppose <laughs> and turned us into custard. They, they managed to make it through. We didn't, uh, we, we flipped upside down. Oh, really? Uh, our buddy Drew here did a backflip out of the boat on this one, I believe. Um, so he was gone shortly after this. He's buried back there somewhere. Uh, Anthony came up to a boat to himself and had to scramble back and try and uh, steer the boat. Here he is. Uh, he's realized that Drew's gone and he's gone back into the driver's seat. And look at this, man. Like, this is, I swam through that. We swam through that, Taylor. That was not cool, yeah. man. It's wild. But how like being risk knocked out of a boat and conditions like that, like the risk of drowning would just be insane. Like how it's, how, how it's the like, real deal, man. I, yeah. I wasn't totally sure if we're all gonna come out of that. I won't lie. Um, yeah, I mean the you know the PFDs like a real a really solid good PFD is quite amazing and how mm. well it'll float you to the surface. Um, yeah. But obviously this is extremely violent water and yeah there's no question that it's dangerous. And, mm. you know, generally speaking, the thing that's, you know, great about this river is that, uh, you know, when I described it earlier is the pool and drop river, when you have these, you know, steady mellow sections that lead to this violent rapid, mm. usually right after the rapid, you have, you know, a, a mellow section that, you know, essentially, you know, if all else fails, you know, you flip a boat and you go out, you know, generally you're going to just flush out into that calm water. Yeah. This is a little bit unique because of the flood stage. Um, mm. But again, still fairly similar. Like this was like a raging rapid. And then, you know, another half mile down the river, it, it goes back to just kind of a mellow flow where yeah. we'd be able to regroup. But, you know, obviously, you know, if you got sucked into something and you drank some water, I mean, it, 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 it could go badly. Mm. So yeah. we kind of it went kind of badly for us. So, so we we were the media boat. So we let these guys go through first while we were shooting it. And yeah, this is probably some of the craziest craziest what what I've ever had to deal with in my life. Um, I can't even see the boat. Like it's <laughs> it's gone. That's, that's a that's, 20 foot, that's a twenty foot one ton boat just gone. Yeah. Man, that's what's gone. so wild about it is how big those boats are, and it's just gone. And oh, so, yeah. so I think, yeah, they did that. They, this sort of it does a, a reasonable sort of job in uh, giving you an idea of what, yeah. kind of what we're dealing with here. Um, I think I've yeah. also got a video or two, if I could just move that so I can see of that. 
that's coming down. Where are we here? They're just at the end there, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to find the one that uh, I was looking for. So I'll play this in the background while we're talking. So, so this is a GoPro of us going through <laughs> those rapids. Uh, there's quite a bit of swearing involved. <laughs> That's just so you know, it's not really PG. There's our happy yeah. sort of faces, you know, we're all good. And, your fucking daddy? You know, we're, we're gonna nail this. Tell us, like, oh, I think I'm a little bit right at the moment, but we'll be all right because once you're here, you can't change your line. Well, you know, the thing about this is there was no, there was actually no steering. It was, I mean, we were immediately in the middle of the hole, like, I, it was just like a tractor beam. The, the water was so big, I mean, you couldn't really paddle any direction you just kind of went where it took you that's rip trying to like high, what high line you notice how there's a shot before the two guys were leading really forward and almost outside of the boat that was literally they're trying to stop the the the, the boat from flipping and we I, I actually don't think he was trying to do anything other didn't than just stop the boat from flipping and uh the boat's upside down and if you see a boat like that upside down it's almost impossible to get back on that boat and even if you do what are you going to do? You've got no war. Like you can't steer it. Mm. You're totally at the mercy of the river. It's a one ton boat. And essentially you're stuck on that boat for God knows how long until it ends up in eddy somewhere, which could be a long way down the track. If you manage to get on and it was kind of like, well, all right, boat's upside down, uh, which is a really bad thing on a boat that big because you can't flip it yourself at all. And then next thing you know, the boat's the right way up. And we're like, what? <laughs> so the white water was so heavy, it was just flipping this boat up and down, a one ton boat, 20 foot boat, like a like a like a top. So Taylor's on the other side, I'm on this side. We both managed to get our way back to the boat. The only reason I think I survived this is is I accidentally um found the bow line came loose. And I wasn't sure I was going to get through that massive rapid, you know, because it's like 10, 15 feet high. And I was like, I'm just swimming with a life jacket. How am I going to push through this with momentum? And I managed to grab a hold of the bow line and the boat got through the rapid. And as it got through the rapid, it flipped the right way up. The bow line pulled me through so I didn't freaking drown. And then I managed to to get back to the boat and I was quite, and, it, and I probably, we would have probably wouldn't have gotten back in if it hadn't flipped itself back up. And uh, we're on the other side. So Taylor and I are coming in like this going, holy shit. And we're like, where's Rip? Where's Rip? And he's somewhere out of the water somewhere. We ended up spotting him a little bit down the way. And this is my GoPro, which I had on my head, which got blasted off my head, which is why it's upside down for a while. And then I sort of reached out with, a, with a, one of the oars to get, to get him. I've been smashed in the face by the, the side of the boat twice. And I was already could hardly see out of one eye. And then I pulled in um, Rip for the boat and he had a helmet and then it smashed me in the face again. <laughs> the same eye. So I was just, just going, oh, I was just like, how are we alive? And everyone's screaming from the side of the boat, thinking we're all screwed and they're going to have to rescue us and stuff. And um, and we freaking made it. Like this Rip just getting back in the boat after headbutting me. And we're all just like, what the hell is still alive? <laughs> How did the boat flip itself back up? What's going on? And all the boys are still screaming from the side, like wondering if, wondering if there's people in the water need to be rescued. And um, we freaking made it. There's my face, like just all smashed up in my eye there. It's just like, there's my drowned rat buddy, Taylor there. <laughs> it's like... That's how you fucking do it, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yelling out at the side crew who are like, safety's on the side. And we're all just like, how the hell are we back in this boat? Like, how did we make it through this back end and not just freaking die? Because we've just seen those guys go through it. We've seen Drew get like catapulted off the back of his own boat and Anthony going down on his own and having to rescue him. And it was, it was, yeah, it was one of the. Did you lose any equipment in that flip? Uh, I thought we might have, but no. I think it flipped back no. up so quickly. We didn't lose a damn thing. Well, wow. what's, what's actually crazy right there, if you stop it, you can see that hat under the oar. Oh, yeah. That hat was just, it was actually, all I had done was put it underneath one of these straps right here, just the brim of it. Yeah. And somehow that it saved stayed it. on the boat. Oh, my is, God completely outrageous like i you know wow. this whole thing it all happened so fast um it's yeah it's a miracle that 
we didn't lose anything. Um, wow. Yeah, including each other, man. Pretty wild. Oh, that was that was edgy, brother. Yeah, like, that was our that was our one bit of carnage, actually. So, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> what what I wouldn't give to have had footage from the uh, the shore of of us yeah. going through because it would have been far more interesting than than what everybody else was doing. But man, we were lucky. <laughs> well, I actually, I just found the video. I was thinking of a um... Yeah, we, we were a bit lucky. Today. I think the biggest thing we were lucky about also the boat coming back upright. So, like, I just give you the sense of the, the power and the speed of the water. It's a bit loud, but just stay with it. Things happen really fast. And there's a lot of water moving around here. They are just gearing up for the really, really big hit. It's, uh, it, that's the one that puts the boat back up again, I think. Yeah, wow. Well. Yeah, you just play topsy turvy, man. You're, you're not really in control on a, on a rapid like that. It's yeah. a lot of water. And there's a big kind of sort of flush out at the end, and the safety guys are over to the right here. And um, mm. yeah, it's uh, that was, was wild. That, that was wild. It was someone else, and um, you know, doing a grade nine rapid in, in full flood. It's like what? <laughs> you never got a choice. You just got to sort of keep going, like. Um, you know, we lost one of our most experienced guides um, that very morning uh, before we hit the big stuff in the flood. And we were just, there was definitely a bit of tension in the air. And I don't know how you were feeling, Taylor, like not, not knowing what the hell we're going to be dealing with with every rapid we came to. And there were rapids that were gone that should have been there. And there were rapids in places they shouldn't have been. Like it was, it was game on, man. What do you mean yeah. by you lost one of your guides? Well, he couldn't make the whole trip. And he oh, actually yeah. had to walk out at Phantom Ranch. And so, um, so we were. Yeah, a, I would, a I would call, yeah. calling him a guide is uh, is generous. <laughs> he was not. He was not a guide. He was a bit um, more experienced than the rest of us. Uh, he he wanted to tell everybody that. Uh, okay, all right. It's a bit like that, was it? Um. Yeah, that was quite good. I want to like, let me shift a little bit because I want to. There's something I want to talk about that I found uh, to be quite epic that I discovered on this last trip versus um, versus these other two. So, you know, I think we were talking about earlier in the um, in the discussion about how, you know, there's you, you put in for a permit at certain times a year. Basically, you have a wide open calendar and the private permits, they give them out all throughout the year. Um, but we've we my first two trips, we for whatever reason kind of targeted uh, what we would call winter trips and you know winter is as it turns out is actually an incredible time to go because of the the mild temperatures uh, my, the good weather and there's just so few people um, and of course it's winter so um, you know it has its own characteristics uh, I had realized that I'd love to see what it would be like in another time of year so this last permit I started putting in for uh, spring dates and it turns out that I drew that date for a March 27th launch. And I just thought, you know, this will be a good time of year to go. I didn't really think really through that much more than, you know, it'd be cool to see it at a different time of year. Um, I'm sure spring would be lovely. It's a great time to get out of here. You know, we have a long winter here in Wyoming and, it just seems like it'd be a great time to be in the desert. What what I did not anticipate was the sort of transition out of winter into spring and what happens in the desert and the weather that comes with it and how it essentially brings the desert to life. And so when we left Flagstaff the first day, it was snowing and we were all just like, oh my God, what have we gotten into? This is gonna be a tough trip. And um, the first few days it was kind of rainy, you know, cold, we had dry suits, we were sleeping in tents. I mean, it was like, man, what is this trip gonna be like? Are we gonna be miserable the whole time? Um, and it just progressively got nicer and nicer. And so we just really hit this like extraordinary time of change from season where, you know, we were getting out of the unsettled spring, you know, win winter to spring transition, that unsettled weather into just the beautiful, you know, spring climate and the desert came to life. 
I mean, it was absolutely incredible. There was grass, everything was green. I mean, you know, it was not something that I anticipated. Green. And wow. it really like completely changed the way that I like, I was all like winter trip, winter trip. That's the time to do it. I think now I'm like, I'm on the spring program because, you know, seeing life in the desert and, and this is like the harshest environment. I mean, the, the deserts of the Southwest and the U S are extraordinary. And I'm sure you guys have some incredible stuff like that in Australia and Tassie as well. Um, I love the desert and seeing this life, you know, we, we probably a lot of times don't associate, you know, the desert with life, but I mean, it's, it has an extraordinary amount of life and to really see it, you know, sort of changing and evolving in front of your eyes over the course of these several weeks was, was quite a treat. And so I'll just sort of peel through a few photos that, that speak to that. Um, let me grab a few and I'll pop them on the screen here. Um, yeah. And, you know, this was really, really a cool thing to witness. And, and um, man, I, I just like, it was a, such a pleasant surprise on the back, you know, on, on this trip, you know, not, you know, kind of not realizing it going into it. So let me get my screen up here. Um, and so, you know, this is a shot at camp. You can start to see some of that green uh, grass growing up into the, you know, coming out. Um, and, oops, sorry, let me get my... I got, here. I got the same shot on our trip and it's really, it's pretty different. Yeah. And so then, you know, wildflowers were starting to pop up. Um, I just like climbed up on this ledge above camp and all of a sudden there was just like this huge spread of wildflowers. And I mean, it was just this incredible thing to see because, you know, you're in this like arid, rough, you know, desolate place. And then there's all this like extraordinary, beautiful in life there. Um, sorry. Um, this is another shot from that same area. There's just like all this, like these like shrubs and stuff that were starting to green up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never seen that course, Wildlife, you know, there's these amphibians and we saw bighorn sheep and, um, you know, all kinds of bird life. Um, just really extraordinary. You see any condors? Uh, we did see condors early in the trip. Yep. Oh, yeah. And this was pretty neat. So at the mouth of Havasu Creek, Havasu is famous for the, uh, the, the mineral water that flows out of the canyon. So you have this extraordinarily beautiful red canyon with these really blue tinted waters. And that comes from a mineral called travertine. And so we pulled up to the mouth of the river or at the mouth of the canyon. Uh, it's a side canyon of, of, the, of the main stretch. And here you can see that, you know, beautiful blue travertine water mixing with the turbid water of the Colorado. And we just happened to be there at the time that the trout were spawning. And so there was just like thousands of trout in this, like in the mouth of this canyon. Yeah, and wow. I can only imagine that this happens, you know, very briefly. And we just happened to, you know, be there at the time and witness it. And I mean, it was just an incredible thing to see. Um, of course, you know, lots of fern and plant life and springs. Um, this was just kind of exploring some black and white. And then here's another shot of that beautiful grass growing. And I, and I, I can't imagine that this lasts very long. Um, oh. You know, it's like hard to know, but, uh, you know, we were there just like really as it was starting. So, you know, I imagine maybe a few weeks or a month, maybe, I mean, it's, you know, it gets pretty hot down there. So, and it's so dry, like I, I would imagine that this kind of like, you know, green tent in the landscape is not going to be there for too long. It's, it's quite a specialized ecosystem as well. Like there's a lot of species of yeah. both flora and fauna that, that in some, some cases have found nowhere else in the world. Because it's such yeah. an incredibly isolated place, and I mean, look at that access. You know, how is you know are creatures and seeds and things going to get in and out of a landscape like that? They're not. So it is a very um, specialist kind of place. Yeah, so, absolutely. And here's here's another example of that. You know, probably this is probably this might have been moon. I don't even remember. Um, but you know, you get that 
that really cool light coming down the canyon. You get these layers, you get the dappled light. Um, it just, you know, it's, this is a, an example of that cool contrast that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then back to some macro work with cacti. And the, of course, the cacti were blooming. I mean, again, this is, uh, I'm, I'm totally blanking on what the name of the cactus is, but this happens, you know, these flowers happen for like probably a week or two. Hmm. And this is just some, you know, more details playing with the flowers. Uh, these are the ocotillos. This is a really beautiful uh, oh. plant that grows all in this area. And then there's the the jump the jumping choya. Mm. It's a pretty nasty cactus if you get too close to it. Heard some um, funny stories with involving those cactus. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> just getting stuck in unfortunate places. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they get in you pretty easily. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, that was a quick aside, but like. I just wanted to kind of touch on that because, you know, that was speaking earlier to, you know, this idea of revisiting places. Um, you know, I where I live is one of the most iconic areas of the United States, you know, the Tetons, Yellowstone. And I mean, I've spent my life photographing those mountains and it's never the same. And, you know, and as a landscape photographer, we're always looking for like the right conditions and you know, the changing conditions and capturing the unique character based on time of year and, you know, whatever's happening in the, in the landscape or environment at the time. And, you know, it's, it's really a joy to like revisit these places and, and see those changes throughout the year and, and, uh, and experience the place that way. And, and uh, you know, I feel real lucky that I've been able to now see that same type of experience in the canyon. And I, I certainly hope that I'll, you know, I'll be able to do that again. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, we're, 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 what's the again thing? I'll um, I'll just share a little bit, just to, just because we're we're uh, getting down the back end of our timing, but um, just to reiterate um, some of the aspects of, of a trip that we we were so comfortable by the end of this trip with the big water we'd had, we were coming up to a grade ten rapid, like the one that people are scared of, and we were just laughing <laughs> how small it was compared to what we've been through. We're like, why don't we just go? go play uh, game of thrones and we'll strap a boat to the front uh, a chair to the front of the boat and you had to make it through the a grade 10 rapid with a beer in your hand <laughs> it was just <laughs> that was just sort of how relaxed we are um and uh oh some gibbons oh my god that guy's a monster so so i'm like wearing a full dry suit and thermals the whole time and he's just in a pair of shorts uh there's nips um, but to give you a sense of the lifestyle, like I was one of the few people that actually had any sort of cover at all. Most people were just sleeping out in the open. So I was feeling like a worse, just, just having some netting, but I don't know about scorpions or what else might be coming down, but this is kind of a kit for the day, um, each day. And, and it's up to you with the, I think one guy lens had a cot, I think, you know, sometimes we're just sleeping in the rocks. Like it's, it's pretty kind of definitely a camping sort of base experience. And we were talking earlier about the setup and the, and this is the one big image download we did on the trip with the setup we kind of had, and we had to be pretty quick about it because uh, batteries weren't so good in those days for either computers or cameras, but uh, I'm really sort of glad we did it. And this is one of the rare kind of really open areas of sand on the Canyon uh, that we came across, uh, which we really loved. That was lens with his uh, cart set up. So it's pretty, uh, pretty elemental experience in the river, just the sound of it, the smell of it. Uh, it's just with you the entire time. Like, um, and in that regard, and you drink the river water. So you literally 70% of the cells in your body are, are becoming like the river water that, um, that you're, you're drinking over that sort of period of time. Um, so it's kind of, um, yeah, it really has, an elemental experience that that is kind of hard to to sort of put into words a little bit. Um, you know, here's one of the campsites that you see that whole area just been eaten away by the flood. That was like the biggest campsite, one of the biggest on the whole trip, and there was just this edge here on, on the edge of it that was left for us. Um, there's so many side trips you can do, like the canyons and some of the ones we did. I think one of the one of the ones we did where we swore not to talk about it in public <laughs> for a few reasons. Yeah, we can't do that. No, I won't go into that, but it was one of the best experiences of my life. You could spend, I don't know, how long could you spend doing these side canyons, man? Like decades, I reckon. You could oh, up. I mean, side. there's literally, there's literally not 
uh, you know, you couldn't do it in a lifetime. I mean, this place, like, it's it's really, really hard to wrap your head around how fast this this place is. I mean, it was one of, you know, to put it into some perspective, it was one of the last, you know, areas of the West that was actually explored during the expansion of the United States. I mean, it was just too big of a of a landscape and, and too difficult of terrain for people to to access. So access, yeah. um it's just yeah it like it literally you could spend several lifetimes exploring what's down there and uh you know really only scratch the surface. Um I I do I do need to give props uh to a friend of mine from our last trip, I, I, this, this would actually be the first official time that I've, I've shared this. Uh, if, uh, if you'll let me take over the screen a little bit, I'll show you something that's actually kind of special. Yeah, I, was just, that. I was just, um, those images that I went through, like to say, so you know, this is actually that exactly where um, Taylor was talking about. This is the, um, Oh yeah. The harvest, the, the harvest. Yeah. You can see that kind of turquoise and, and the water. And this yeah. is kind of, um, I was trying to find a shop that had, and this is the interest of it there, where, where probably yeah. the walls were mixing that, that Taylor was talking about. I look so much different now than that last time we were there. Yeah. Anyway, so so uh, we, as you, Paul, you may be aware of my affinity for river surfing. That's something that I, I kind of actually got into a, a bit more uh, obsessively post Grand Canyon. 2014 um yeah, we have this, this incredible river wave uh that comes in uh in the spring here in jackson and that's a whole nother podcast or story or whatever but i i have a very good friend who i've you know i've, I've become part of that community here and a very good friend of mine uh and i felt that there was potential to surf a river wave in the grand canyon uh, it's, to our best knowledge and research, we weren't able to figure out, find that anybody else had done this before. And, and we were pretty certain that it could be done. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where you have to really commit to it. Um, you know, I'm sure nobody's, we're, we're, we're pretty convinced that nobody else has done this. And, you know, it requires taking surfboards and, you know, making this a, a, a goal of your trip. and. <laughs> I don't think anybody's taking surfboards down the Grand Canyon. Certainly people are, they're taking stand-up paddle boards, but there's a distinct difference. And so we spent, um, you know, quite a bit of time during the first portion of this last trip searching for a wave that could be surfed. And uh, we, we gave it an honest effort on a bunch of different spots that might have gone if we had had a little bit more time but as we've you know been talking about before you you're constantly moving you you can't just stay in one place so you've only got so much time to explore you know things that are going on you know that as you're as you're moving down the river and so you know every few days or, or throughout the first part of the trip that he was on you know we would you know we'd find something that had potential and we give him a little time and you know see if he could make a go at it and you know got close a number of times, uh, but it just kept being a struggle. Uh, and then the next to the last day of the trip, uh, we he was out in front of me on the paddleboard kind of scouting, and he came running back to me and was like, I've got it. I can do this. And we eddied out and let him get out there and give it a go, and he made it happen. Uh <laughs> it was it it was incredible and of course like always the picture doesn't do it justice yeah. um but this he paddled out he, so first of all he had this board shaped for this trip mm. uh from a, a shaper down in uh, santa barbara california and he um paddled out into the middle of the river i mean this is like you know giant cold water uh, he's wearing a probably four, three wetsuit. And so he paddles out, catches it on the fly and serves it properly. And it was absolutely incredible. 
Uh, we all tried. I, I couldn't catch the wave. It was just like scary and cold. And I, you know, I tried a few times, but it, I just, I gave it my effort and I was like, I can't, I'm, I'm good. I can't do it anymore. Um, but we managed to pull this off and, you know, we're making the claim that, you know, this is the first proper river surf in the Grand Canyon history. So uh, pretty cool, pretty cool thing to, uh, wow. to share with the world. And uh, we've actually been a little bit, uh, kind of been holding it a little bit close because we, you know, the park service, I'm not sure they'd be too happy with this because of the, uh, the fact that we're not wearing a PFD. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a calculated risk. We're experienced and we felt like we were comfortable with that. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, this is one of the first, you know, public announcements of what we did. And, and we're, we're pretty proud of it. Like he was, he, he was very, very, uh, you know, this is a very cool accomplishment. and uh, It was uh, pretty awesome to be able to share with him. Yeah, if, if people don't know, that it's a, it's hugely committed because um, the chances of actually, because the speed of the water flowing downriver uh, in, in order to even get to where the wave is, you need to be able to read the river ahead of time to be able to position yourself in a way that by the time you get to the wave, you haven't already got washed past it. And the balance you need is unbelievable. And the second you lose your footing, you're getting washed down the river as well, like just swimming. So it's kind of... Um, there's a yeah. lot going on. So I'll just, I'll peel through a couple photos here. This is Gannett. That's yeah, the board that got shaped. And that's actually, this is his face actually after he surfed it the first time. And he was very emotional. Like he's, he's one of the most uh, obsessed surfers I know. And he put a lot of effort and heart into this. And it was just really uh, cool yeah. to see him, see him yeah. get it done. Yeah. And so here he is paddling out into the, the middle of the river and you know he catches it on the fly serves it a bit and yeah pretty cool and then there's a portrait of him after and you know we're we're officially renaming it gannett's wave um, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna i'm gonna make him a special um river map slash i'm gonna i'm gonna take the river map and edit it put some photos in it and put gannett's wave on, on river mile 68 for him Oh man, I can only guess the amount of thought that's gone and, and energy has gone into even attempting this, man. Like that's um Yeah. It was it was pretty gnarly. I mean, this was a big uh this was a big accomplishment. I mean, it, it's I don't know, it's kind of hard to summarize it. I mean, you know, obviously it's something we're passionate about and and um, you know, it's it may not look it looks kind of tame, you know, from the photos. Again, it's hard to give a perspective of like how intense that is. Well, um but man, that river is cold. It's scary. It's big, and you know, it's one thing to be sitting in a boat. It's another thing entirely to be swimming in it with a surfboard and no PFD, and and it was, it was pretty wild. So we're 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 pretty. I'm I'm super proud of them, and wow. uh, it's really cool to you know to be able to share and something we should probably put out there and announce. But um, you know, we've, we've kind of kept it close at this until this time. Yeah, that's a that's a nice way to to finish off the story for today, man. We're um, hats off to get it, man. Give it, like I know enough to know about river surfing that it's way, 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 way gnarly that you can possibly even imagine if you even attempt it. And I know some of the best uh, and most experienced surfers in the world that can't even pull it off. Uh, and there's lots of uh, lots of things, lots of people out there that have tried as well, and they're doing it in such a unique and remote location where you literally have to. Um, you know, carry stuff down for weeks just to even be able to attempt it. Uh, specialist yeah. equipment, with, you know, with limited room on the boat as well. It's, it's quite a committing thing to do. And, and yeah, basically when you fall off there, you're going to be getting washed almost probably around that corner before you can even get off the river, just so you know. So it's um, yeah, every it's, single it's, attempt is very significant. It's, uh, it's pretty gnarly. Um, and, yeah, we did it, baby. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've actually got a great film that I made with Gannett that I don't know if you guys drop links in your description or whatever the videos, but um, I could drop you guys that link if you want to add it to it. Yeah, I, that'd I be shot good. a beautiful, beautiful film with him a few years ago, uh, surfing the wave here in, here in Jackson. And, you know, it's an extraordinary place. I mean, that could be a whole nother discussion. You know, that's been my obsession the last few years. Um, and there's some really beautiful footage. It's a beautiful landscape and beautiful place. And, 
you know, maybe people would enjoy seeing that. So I'll, I'll forward you guys the link if you want to you know, include that. Yeah, absolutely. Right, as, as much as it takes about two years to get you on a show, I'd, I'd actually love to have you back, Taylor, and do like a photographer's portrait where you have freedom to roam about a lot of your documentary editorial um, and travel photography from around the world. And, you know, and so if you go on Taylor's website, um, you've got two, don't you, Taylor? So which one do you want to send people to for? for yeah, I, I would. I mean, I think. I mean, you're welcome to look at both. I can give you all the links. I mean, my, you know, the work that I, I typically share with, you know, people in this context is, is my commercial site, which is taylorglennphoto.com. Mm -hmm. um, and that has a good overview of kind of my, you know, I guess who I am as a Adventure, people, that. landscape. It's very broad. Yeah. And, but I mean, there's so many cool projects in there for different places around the world. And I was browsing and it looks like there's some Aussie stuff there as well. I saw Seacliff Bridge and Canangra Walls in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I so that you know, one of my one of the highlights of my career in the last few years is uh was a, a Nat Geo assignment to go photograph national parks in New South Wales. Um yeah. and I kind of got a, a carte blanche to well, I had a list of places I had to go, but they just said, Here's your here's the parks, here's you know. Here's a budget. Go over there and have fun and get some pictures. And uh, that was a pretty special trip. So, um, you know, yeah, man, awesome. what a beautiful place. I, I, I'm due for another visit to your part of the world. I, I mean, it's just an extraordinary area. And uh, would love to come down and, and spend some time with you guys. And go make some pictures. Absolutely. The, uh, yeah, you, gotta come, you should come right to Franklin River, brother. Man, That's too many things to do. That's the premier uh, rafting trip in, the, in this part of the world. It's a, it's a good uh, 11, 12 days, super, super remote. Uh, in some ways, it's more remote. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I imagine, you know, Taylor's list is a mile long, but it's already pretty mile long already places he's already been. So I highly recommend going through his site just to get a, a taste of it. And uh, I love some of the projects you've done over the years and, particularly mm -hmm. things like the specialist project you did on the native portraits of the Yellowstone animals. I really love that. There's actually um, some aerial photography. Taylor and I did an incredible aerial trip um, to Mojave Desert and and uh, and Death Valley together, which I'd spent months sort of setting up and we ended up doing it together. I remember roping Taylor into it with uh, Captain Shell, who I actually just found out is still flying, man. He's 85. <laughs> is he still at it? He's still flying. <laughs> oh, my God. Man, I was worried about him. I was wondering if he was – I. oh, man. What a what a character! I don't think yeah. I'd get in an airplane with him again, but that yeah. was sure a fun experience. And those pictures, I mean, I still love them, and I I loved that you allowed me to join you on that. I mean, it was very gracious of you to put all that together. And I mean, man, we could do a whole other. We could have multiple multiple episodes on all the things that we've we done and 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 uh and that just that one deserves some attention too because it was such a unique perspective you know i've only seen one other person who actually shot it more recently uh who has photographed that place in that way that we did that was a very unique thing yeah. and you know i'm just so grateful that you put that together um you know seeing the world from a a fixed wing aircraft or even a drone, but you know, that perspective is such an incredible thing. And I know that's one of your specialties and I just love seeing those pictures that you share and, and um, man, anytime I can get into some sort of flying craft, I I'm, I'm in, it's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got, you got bitten by the bug there, brother. Yeah, I just can't afford those, uh, all those expensive trips, man. I've, I've done a few of them and heli time is not cheap. No, no, it depends how you do it. I, just so you know, Taylor, I just um, had an exhibition six weeks ago, and which was eight and a half thousand kilometers worth of aerial exploration around South Australia wow. with uh, two other photographers that we've done over the last two and a half years. And um, yeah, it kind of uh, it's been really successful. Actually, we we we've just sold like thirty five prints or something on the on the first exhibition alone. So we're just setting up another one, and I'm heading over there in a couple of days to um, uh, check out the next gallery for our next exhibition. Actually, but it's. If you share it and you find ways, like we had a private pilot who's a friend of ours and um, we shared it between three people, it, it became really quite cost effective for the amount of um, quality and range of material you get in a short space of time. It's almost impossible to match it, to be honest. Um, yeah. 
That's well, be, I reckon if we did another show, which I'd love to, Taylor, because uh, I feel like uh, there's all this incredible work you've done in South America and Africa and different places around the world. Uh, and a lot of the peoples of the world that you really supported, a lot of the creatures in the world you've, you've connected with, let alone the exploration of America alone, that, that maybe you can come back on for that. And, and you and I might do, might share some, some of that Mojave trip as well as part of it, which could be really nice. Because I've kind of been sitting on that material quite a bit as well. Um, I haven't really shared a huge amount of it, and it could be really nice to share it together, actually. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many things that, you know, I would love to, to talk about the business side of things. I would love to learn from you guys, like how, what your world looks like. I mean, I think, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things where the market and the the business model overlap, but there's got to be some things that are different too in terms of just, you know, the fact that you guys are in a totally different part of the world and, you know, what that looks like. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated by how, you know, we like make this work, you know, everybody's path is unique. We all have our own certain set of circumstances. You know, there's no playbook to making this work. It's a constant hustle. You know, it's a, an extraordinary privilege um, you know, to be able to do this work and to have these experiences and to share them with people. And, you know, I don't take that lightly. Um, I know I've been very fortunate, uh, but I've also worked my ass off. And no, you work it's, hard, brother. Yeah. And it's, it's great because I, I know that anybody who's doing it is working their ass off. You know, there's just no other way around it. Right. Like, you know, whether you're doing it, you know, as a second hobby and it may not be your full-time gig or, whatever it is. I mean, it just takes, you know, dedication and passion and, and, um, you know, you, everyone should pat themselves on the back for, you know, for taking this road and, and, you know, following a path that, you know, they're trying to do something that they love and share with, share with the world. And, and, um, you know, that would be another great conversation at some point with you guys. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you two favors. One, uh, I want to hold you to that, that, um, that we find a space in your crazy world, lifestyle that, that fits in with mine that we can actually do that together uh number two i want to finish the show with my favorite photograph and i think it might be ben's as well that you already shown us it's that one where it's the broad one we are looking front on on the raft open it's you can see the sandstorm and the clouds in the sky um yeah. and i just i just want to i just want to remember that photograph and just sit with it because it's just it's yeah. kind of it's like haunting my soul that photograph it it captures an essence of that place that I don't think I've ever seen captured in that way. And it just has this ancient feeling about it. It could be a hundred year old photograph, you know, shot on a, on a yeah. um, eight by 10 sort of, sort of film camera, you know, or cyanotype. And, and yet I know enough to know that it's the atmospherics that are actually lending that aesthetic to the whole photograph. And I think it really speaks incredibly to this journey, this place, the grandeur of it, the immensity of it, the, just how belittling it can be as a, as a human being to, to be present in this landscape. Like yeah. to me, it looks like a romantic era oil painting. Like it's just yeah. the, the atmosphere and the, the scale. Um, like, yeah, it's just fantastic. And it just yeah conveys that grandeur so well. Um, and I saw it when you put it as your background, I was like, Oh, I need to see that bigger. So yeah, it's definitely my favorite. It's um. And yeah. yeah, just the the lighting and conditions with that you, that sandstorm was it that he was saying that kind of made yeah. it give it that yeah. light, just such a unique quality to the light that um yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. I mean, it's yeah, it's a great it, it is a great image to end on. I mean, it really, you know, these are, I guess in a way, these are this is like the kind of like these are the conditions we're seeking where you get, you know, this incredible emotion. Mm. or ambiance or whatever it is in, in in a scenario that that creates you know I, that that it creates that emotion right like you know you can't you can't you can't just make this like this is about being in the place and being being present and responding to those conditions and having the fortune to be there when they happen um you know this was like this this was this last spring trip and you know, I mentioned we had some weather throughout the trip that was challenging. You know, there were days where the wind was blowing so hard that it was literally blowing us upstream. Like it was, oh my God. it was actually quite serious. And we were, there were times we were wondering if we were actually going to be able to like make progress because it was wow. blowing so hard. You, you couldn't go down river. It was, it's pretty That's wild. Um, and, 
this just happened to be one of those, you know, one of those days we were having that wind and, and it created this it just epic conditions. And I mean, I, of course, we, we treat our photos. There is a little bit of, you know, processing here from the raw file, but I mean, this was, this was, the, this was what it looked like. You know, this wasn't me, mm. you know, manipulating or, you know, heavy doing anything, you know, adding too much to it. Like it, it was, like this is, this is the conditions we had and the light we had. And, and it was just absolutely extraordinary. And it, it is also one of my favorite images of the whole trip. And that mm. just lends, you know, to the, to the idea that like, you know, there's only so many things that, you know, as landscape photographers that, you know, we can control and mm. you just have to get out there. You have to like visit these places. And, you know, I've got thousands of pictures from these trips of this scenario that look like this from the standpoint of the composition, the small, you know, boat, the subject and this vast Canyon. But I guarantee you, none of them look like this and it just is a matter of like this was the moment these were the conditions and, and that yeah. that's what made the image and you yeah. know we got to just keep getting out there and making pictures and you know every now and then we 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 come across you know an opportunity like this and and this might be one of those that you know goes into one of the the few of our favorite pictures of all time but you know i i don't know i i don't know about you guys but i don't really like to look at my own pictures i like i love making them and then i'm like <laughs> move on um, but this is certainly one that I, that I love and it, it's just cause it takes me to that moment and, and it says so much about, you know, what you were speaking to Paul about, about the place, the journey and, and just the feeling of it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's uh it's the perfect, perfect image to end on, man. And I, it's one that I, I could spend a lot of time with. It's burned in the back of my retinas now, this one. So yeah. I'll, I'll forever be associating this with you, my friend and, and my relationship to this place as well. But, um, We'll probably start um, wrapping up now to see. Uh, Ben's got to head off and, and we're, we're a good chunk of time over our regular time, which I knew we would be, which is why I set it up, knowing that we would. And, you know, we kind of, we've, we've given you a little bit of a flavor. We've kind of just scratched the surface. And um, I kind of separate, separately deliberately didn't flesh out Taylor and all, all of who he is and, and what he's capable of doing on this episode uh, because I want to get him back and, and give him the space that he deserves for the incredible image maker that he is. And and leave it leave a little bit of the tank for that. So um, really appreciate your time, brother, and and your passion. And uh, you know this is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, adventure of my life. And I wouldn't have done it without you and without your invitation of all the many, many men and people you could have invited from around the world. The fact that you asked me just sort of meant the world to me, man. And um, well, for the record, you were invited on this last one too, but you couldn't come. So you know, no. you've, had, you've you've had another opportunity. We're just going to put that out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. It's um, it's it weighed on me that I won't lie, it weighed on me. But well, uh, you know what? There'll be another. There'll be another one somewhere down the road. And you know, I'm I'm just uh, grateful that you guys took the time to to share all this. And Ben, it's nice to meet you. And I, yeah. I want to learn more about your work. I you know I hated that all this dominated about you know what we were doing. But you know, at some point, you know, we'll have to dive into your work too. But I you know I just appreciate you guys and what you're doing and your passion for, you know, sharing, you know, this creative path we're on and I, I'm happy to come anytime. I, I love sharing and talking about it and especially with people who appreciate it so much. And uh, I yeah. really, it's uh, it really is a joy. So thank you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It was we're, we're, a pleasure we're... to have you on Taylor. Yeah. Great to meet you. Great to just, yeah. Such an inspiring story and just, yeah. Um, from someone who hasn't experienced anything like it, you gave a really good sense of um, yeah, both of you just kind of what, just a little just that little slice of what it's like just in and of itself was amazing to see so um yeah no it's inspired me very much so and it's a, yeah just that view of the grand canyon that you just don't see in your typical instagram post from you know the classic sort of u bend um shot or whatever it's just a whole nother experience um so no yeah really really great authentic storytelling through the photos um and that's, that's what it's all about it's a deeply immersive experience that just just works its way into your soul. I don't, I don't know how to describe it, man. It's uh, and literally that river becomes your body, you know, like you, you drink that river every day, you spend time on it every day. Uh, it literally becomes physically and emotionally and, and almost spiritually part of who you are from, from a giving yourself that amount of space and time in a wild place as well, which is very rare. 
Three, I've never done anything where I spent three and a half weeks in a wild place in one spot ever. Mm. And I don't know if I potentially ever will again in my life. It, it's a huge commitment that rarely people gift to themselves. And it really is a gift to yourself. Mm. It, 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 it is. And it, it's hard to do it. The older you get, it gets harder and harder. And I don't, you know, I don't take it lightly that I, you know, I, I, I realized how lucky I was to have done this several times and, you know, even more so now at this stage in life. And, and, um, I mean, man, you know, I think one of the most special things about it, and I can't emphasize this enough, like anytime you have an opportunity to unplug and be present and just immerse yourself in a place, even if it's just for 24 hours, you know, take advantage of that. You know, this world is, it's moving fast. It's a crazy time. There's all kinds of wild shit happening out there. And, you know, it's just more important than ever to, you know, step back and, and really give yourself space and, and be, you know, be present. And, and so, you know, just take advantage of it whenever you have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, we'll wrap it up there, but yeah, fantastic to talk to you, Taylor. Um, yeah, we'd love to have you back on as well. Um, thanks for all your, yeah, inspirational talks and yeah, the photos are uh, just fantastic to look at. So, um, cool. yeah. Well, special man. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna press stop record, but I'm gonna uh, give myself another few minutes with you, my friend. Because it's been like three years. So we're signing off now. Episode 113. Um, soak it up. And if you weren't inspired about doing something adventurous out of your comfort zone, maybe have a good think about that because life's short and there's epic things to be done. Yeah. All Amen. right. See you, everyone. See you on the next episode. Yes. Thank you.